Suspense. This is the man in black, here to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In Hollywood this evening, our two distinguished stars are the lovely actress Margot and the polished young actor from Holland, Mr. Philip Dorn. A story by John Dixon Carr dealing with strange, very strange happenings aboard an ocean liner and called Cabin B-13 is tonight's tale of Suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with Cabin B-13 and with the performances of Margot as Anne Brewster and Philip Dorn as Dr. Carl Heinrich, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Come now, in happier peacetime days, to a great ocean liner on the night of her departure for Europe. There she is at the West 22nd Street Pier, the 25,000-ton Moravania of the White Planet Line. Smoke from her three funnels coils up lazily in mild October air. You can see the decks, white and shiny like shoeboxes, and the string of lights along them, and the band standing by on a deck to play her out. You can hear the murmur of an excited crowd and the rattle of the steam winches as cargo is lowered into the hold. You can see the bustle of activity and the second officer standing at the head of the gangplank as two rather late passengers hurry through the customs shed towards that gangplank. It's all right, Vicky. We are not too late. No, and I thought we'd be in time. A honeymoon in Europe. Three whole months with nothing to worry about. That's right, dear. And you've been my wife for, uh, let's see, practically five hours now. I believe the correct phrase is, is, ah, uh, it was so sudden, Mr. Brewster. <laughs> <laughs> so sudden that we have to travel on our own passports instead of a husband and wife one. <laughs> I hope they don't think you're not an honest woman. I'm going to act like a complete wanton, just a devil. You. <laughs> oh, what about our tickets, Ricky? Do we give them to that officer standing at the top of the gangplank? <laughs> no, honey, you keep your ticket. The cabin steward will come around and collect it after we're underway. And... The money, Ricky? Mm. It's a lot of money, Ann. I... $10,000 in cash. Maybe I'd better turn it in at the purse's office for safekeeping. Yes, maybe you had. Wait a minute, Ricky. What is it, then? Wait. Do you mind if we stand here for a second before we go up the gangplank? Oh, what's the matter? You're not ill, are you? No, but... Getting over brain fever isn't any joke. Oh, I know, dear. You see, Ricky, I... I ought to be eager and excited like all those people up there, but suddenly you get fancies. Queer, sick fancies. Suddenly, right now, all I can think of is the night and the wind and all the black water in the dark. And that's exactly the kind of morbid fancy I'm trying to cure you of. I know, Ricky. I I'll be good, but I was just thinking of a story. What story? Oh, never mind. It, it doesn't matter. Which way do we go? Up the gangplank, through that door there, and then down on the elevator to B deck. And no more horrors, do you understand? <laughs> uh, here we are, Ann. B deck and cabin number. Good Lord. B 13. B 13. You're not superstitious, are you? Why, no, dear. Not about things like that. Open the door. Here we are. Lights on and... Oh, Ricky, darling. It's a beautiful cabin. Well, best I could get. Well, they've got a luggage in anyway. And over there, madam, you'll find a basket of fruit and some books from your obedient servant. Oh, you are nice to me. And I'm feeling so much better, Ricky. I will be all right, darling. <laughs> of course you will. But uh, you won't find any detective novels among those books. Please. Please, Rick. Detective novels may be all right for presidents and college professors, but they're straight poison to you. You'll read love stories. I like it. You know, Ricky, I keep thinking and thinking about that story I mentioned. Oh, what story, dear? It's an old one. You probably know it, but it was new to me. 
A woman and her daughter arrive in Paris and go to a hotel. Oh, you mean the old Paris exposition story? Yes, that's it. The daughter goes out. When she returns, her mother has disappeared. And even the hotel room isn't the same. The proprietor of the hotel swears the girl came there alone and that there never was a mother. The whole room is different when she goes back to look at it. The girl goes to the police and they won't believe her and she's nearly crazy. Of course, it turns out that the mother has caught bubonic plague and died. And they're hushing it up so that the visitors won't keep away from the city and ruin the whole exposition. And but you've got to stop this kind of talk. I know. But imagine being in a situation like that. With all those queer eyes staring at you. Wondering if you'd lost your reason. Wondering if your brain had cracked and the whole world might dissolve and... Listen. Well, that's the last call, Anne. We'll be underway any minute now. You know, Ricky, I would like to see the skyline go past and the Statue of Liberty and the rest of it. Oh, then why not go up and see it? I've got to deposit this money in the purse's office on CDAM. But... I, I I don't like you to leave me. Oh, now look here, dear. You don't think I'm going to disappear, do you? I suppose I don't, really. When I get these ideas, and I can't help it, Ricky, I wish you'd wallop me. <laughs> I'm not going to wallop you, Anne, <laughs> but you've got to stop being afraid. You certainly won't disappear in a crowded ship with any number of people all around you. As for me, <laughs> I defy Houdini himself to make me vanish. Don't talk like that. I'm not going to vanish, and neither is this cabin, dear. Now, I'll run along. I'll join you on deck as soon as I can. All right, Ricky. I'll be good. In with your gangplank! In with your gangplank! Gangplank, please, sir. Close the rails! Stand by! Eager people, excited people, happy people, all crowding up to the rail to wave goodbye. Nothing to worry about, nothing on their minds except... Except what? Oh. Except seasickness, madam? Oh. Well, I beg your pardon. I hadn't meant to startle you, believe me. Please don't mention it. How silly of me. It was my fault. I, I haven't been very well. I noticed it, madam, if you'll forgive me. That was why I spoke to you. As you see by my uniform, I'm the ship's doctor. This is a British ship, isn't it? But you don't sound British. No, I'm an Austrian, madam. Dr. Paul Heinrich, at your service. I'm not very popular in my own country today. Days of colored shirts and vacant minds. I'm Mrs. Brewster, doctor. Ann Brewster. When does the ship go? In about a second, Mrs. Brewster. You will hear the whistle, then the band will strike up, all langs in, and then... We're moving, aren't we? Yes. Oh. Don't you feel the vibration of the engine? I imagine this is not your first crossing, madam. Oh, I'm afraid it is, Dr. Heinrich. My husband's crossed many times, he tells me, but not on this ship. Well, then I hope you're a good sailor. Why, Dr. Heinrich? Well, because we'll run into some very dirty weather once we're out at sea. October is a very bad month for traveling. Well, if I do get seasick, Doctor, I'll rush straight to you, and I'll expect to be cured. <laughs> Let me tell you a secret, madam. There are two common ailments for which medical science has no cure. One is ordinary seasickness, and the other is hangover. <laughs> Tomorrow morning I shall be dealing with both. And enjoying it? Oh, no, 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 no. Sympathizing with it. That's all I can do. How do you like the Moravania? Oh, it's a magnificent ship from what I've seen of it. And you know they've given us a very nice cabin down on B-deck, B-13. What's the matter? Why are you looking at me like that? I beg your pardon. Did you say B-13? Yes. Why not? You're quite sure of that, madam? Why, yes, of course I'm sure of it. I, I saw the number on the door. Why not? Well, because... 
Go on, Dr. Heinrich. Because there's no such cabin aboard a ship. I'm not joking, Mrs. Brewster. You see, some people are superstitious. Many ships, like this one, omit number 13 on each deck. You must have been mistaken. What are you trying to tell me? Do you think I saw something that wasn't there? No, no, Mrs. Brewster, not at all. Then come along I with only... me. I'll show you. I'll prove to you that there is a number 13. Will you come along? Yes, Mrs. Brewster. I think perhaps I had better escort you. Stewardess, stewardess. Yes, miss. Yes, ma'am. Come in straight away. Tell me, stewardess, this is B-deck, isn't it? B-deck, ma'am? Why, yes, ma'am. No doubt about that. But Dr. Heinrich and I have been all over this part of the ship looking for cabin number 13, but we don't... I've been trying to convince this lady stewardess that there's no such cabin, uh, cabin number 13 on this ship. Why, there sure to heaven isn't, ma'am, and never has been. I've served aboard the Moravania a matter of eight years, and I ought to know. But I tell you, I saw it. I was in there. It was a big cabin with a private bathroom attached. The walls were paneled in light oak, and the furniture was rosewood and yellow satin, and the portholes were like real windows. Oh, no, that's not much good, ma'am. No, I'm afraid not. Most of the cabins hereabouts look like that. May I ask you, what name was the cabin booked in? Brewster, naturally. Mr. and Mrs. Richard E. Brewster. Yeah, let's have a look on my list. No. No, there's no Brewster here, ma'am. I tell you, I was in there. They even delivered the luggage. I saw it. Excuse me, ma'am. But I had a look-see in all the cabins I'm in charge of, just to see if the passengers wanted anything. And I don't remember any luggage with a Brewster label on it. Wait a minute. There may be a partial explanation of this. Ah, you see, that's better, Mrs. Brewster. I was hoping you might find one. Ricky, that's my husband. Ricky and I have only been married a very short time, and... When my maid printed the baggage label, she... She must have made them out in my maiden name. I never noticed at the time. Oh, what name might that be, ma'am? Thornton. Anne-Marie Thornton. Oh, Lord, miss. Now, why couldn't you have said that before? I remember it well. Um, two silk cases and a little trunk. They're in B-16 now. Where's B-16? Right behind you, miss. You're standing practically in front of the door. Oh, thank goodness, you. Oh, yes, but, uh, what about my husband's luggage? There's no gentleman's luggage in that cabin, miss. Your husband's or any other gentleman's, if you know what I mean. I won't stand for this. Where's Ricky? What have you done with Ricky? Please, Mrs. Brewster, there's oh. one easy way to settle this. Settle it? How? Just look down the corridor. You notice the man coming towards us, the man with the two gold stripes around the sleeve? Well? That's Mr. Marshall, our second officer. Did you ever see him before? I... Uh, yes. Yes, of course I have. He was standing at the top of the gangplank when Rick and I got aboard. Mm, exactly. So he might be able to tell us something. Oh. Mr. Marshall? Mr. Marshall? Yes, Doctor. What's up? Would you mind coming here for a moment? Well, not at all, old boy. Always glad to oblige a chap who may have to cut me up at any moment. Eh? <laughs> what may I do for you? Take a good look at this young lady. And oh. tell me, have you seen her before? Seen her before? <laughs> My dear chap, if I had overlooked a uh, young lady, will pardon me, I know, a passenger as charming as this lady is, I would be less of the gentleman than I fancy myself. Eh? <laughs> you saw her coming, coming aboard tonight? Oh, yes, certainly. And, uh, of course, you saw the gentleman who was with her. The uh, gentleman who was with her? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, uh, but there was nobody with her, old boy. <laughs> You're quite certain of that, Mr. Marshall? Oh, my dear doctor, she was the last of them to come aboard. I'll take my Bible oath there was no other passenger with her, or ahead of her, or behind her, if it comes to that. You're lying. You're lying to me. Please, what? please, Mrs. Brewster, lower your voice. I know what it is. It's the old Paris trick, like in the story. But you won't get away with it, do you hear? Now, look here, madam. I'll go to the purser. I'll go to the captain. Oh, <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, won't anybody believe me? <laughs> Later that night, in the captain's room just abaft the bridge, there is a conference of ship's officers. Outside, stung by spray clinging to the bulkhead rail in the dark, a frightened girl waits until the door of the cabin's room opens. Will you bring the Dr. Heinrich, close the door. Yes, sir. Here we are. 
This is Captain Wainwright. Now just tell your story straightforwardly and uh, please don't excite yourself. Well, um, maybe we can get some decision into this matter. Will you sit down here beside my desk, Miss Thornton? My name is Brewster, Captain. Mrs. Ann Brewster. Ah, whatever you say, Mrs. Brewster. Thank you very much, Captain. I might tell you, ma'am, I've got a lot on my mind already. The first officer comes aboard with an attack of flu. I'm facing an equinoctial gale short-handed. And now this has to happen on top of it. I'm terribly sorry. I can't help that, Captain. But I want to know what they've done with Ricky. Just one moment, please, while I get this straight. But this time, I understand, you yourself have personally interviewed practically every single passenger aboard this ship. Is that true? Yes, it's true. But your alleged husband is not here. Is that true? Yes, that's true, In but In the I... meantime, the purser has sent a squad of men to search this ship. They've searched every inch of it. You can take my word for that. There's nobody hidden. Your husband's not here. According to Mr. Marshall, who's standing over there... I see him. According to Mr. Marshall, he never was here. Oh, hang it all, Miss Thornton. You needn't glare at me like that. We couldn't see the chap. He wasn't there, now could we? Be quiet, Mr. Marshall. Yes, I, I, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm not unreasonable, Mrs. Brewster. I think you'll admit that. But what can I do? What can I say? Can you offer any proof, even, that this husband of yours ever existed? Proof? Yes, of course I can. I... Excuse me for interrupting, but would you mind, Captain, if I ask you a question or two? No, Doctor, go ahead. I tell you I'm going daft myself. If you were married, Mrs. Brewster, you must be carrying a joint husband and wife passport. Where is that? Well, there wasn't time to get one. We each carried our own passport. Oh, I see. But still, there must be someone back in America who can confirm what you say if you got in touch by radio telephone. Your parents, for instance. I haven't got any parents. They're dead. What about relatives, then, or a guardian? My guardian is a trust company. The administrators don't even know I'm married. But somebody must have performed the ceremony of marriage, the pass and the justice of peace. Yes, of course, of course. But, oh, I, I, I can't remember the name of the town. You don't remember the name of the town? Well, tie to your chair, Mrs. Brewster. The ship is going to pitch again. How's the glass looking, Mr. Marshall? Uh, oh, uh, barometer's rising, sir. This weather won't hold long. We shall be in the fog before morning, though. We're in a fog now, if you ask me. This lady says she I'm terribly sorry, but I'm, I'm trying to think of it. It was a little town in upstate New York where they can marry you at a moment's notice. Ricky kept the certificate. I... I was confused. I haven't been well. No, you haven't. You see, Ricky had been away, and he came back, and... I was in love with him, and he, he sort of swept me off my feet, and... Oh, what's the use? Uh, not much use, apparently. If you'll take my advice, ma'am, you'll go below to your cabin and get some sleep. I'll send the doctor down to mix you a sedative. You think I'm crazy, don't you? I... I think you're a little overwrought, ma'am. What I can't understand is why. Why? Why should you want to do this? It can't be the bubonic plague this time. Bubonic plague, ma'am? Who said anything about the bubonic plague? Never mind. But I'll show you. You're all against me, except maybe the doctor. But I'll show you. I'll prove it to you. I am going downstairs, and I don't want anybody to follow me. Good night. Good night, all of you. Well, I'm glad that's over. Look here, Mr. Marshall. Huh? You think it's quite safe to trust her out there alone? Well, I don't know, sir. She's mad as a hatter, if you ask me. You think she might uh, do something foolish? Well, I think she might chuck herself overboard if we're not careful. What's your opinion, Doctor? I can give you my opinion, gentlemen, in a very few words. That girl is as sane as you are. What's that? Sane? Wait and hear what I have to say. I shared your own belief at first, but I've been talking to her all evening. I've heard the whole story, and there's not a psychopathic trait in her nature. She firmly believes in this husband. Yes, Doctor. A lot of people firmly believe they're Napoleon, but they get tossed into loony bins, as I say. This matter is not a joke, Mr. Marshall. I tell you, this man exists, or did exist. What do you mean, Doctor? I suppose did he has exist. been murdered. Perhaps he has been murdered and thrown overboard. Murdered? Thrown overboard? If you remember, Richard Brewster was carrying a very large sum of money in cash. His wife's wedding gifts. Practically all her inheritance. 
He meant to go to the purser's office. But he never got there. That money might have, might have been a great temptation... To whom? To a stewardess, perhaps, or even to, uh, to a ship's officer. Just exactly what are you getting at? Well, numbers on doors can be changed easily enough. Just print a small card and put it on the metal slot on the door. I still want to know you what you're driving at. If you use your intelligence, gentlemen, I think you will understand how a man can be made to vanish into thin air. And uh, why Mr. Marshall saw never another passenger. You still don't see it? No, I do not. Well, then listen. And I'll explain exactly how it's been created. Four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock. The hour of suicides and bad dreams. The gale has subsided. The sea is calm. The SS Moravania creeps blindly at barely eight knots through a thick and strangling fog. The whole ship is dark and sealed up in sleep. There's no sound in all that mournful dimness, except when the foghorn cries out a warning overhead. Even cabin B-16 is dark. Anne Brewster, still fully dressed, lies restlessly across one of the berths, her head almost touching the intercabin telephone. <sighs> what was... Oh, I thought I heard... <sighs> telephone. Yes? Hello? It's me, Ann. Uh, take it easy now. Ricky! Ricky, where are you? Quiet. Keep your voice down. Where are you, Ricky? What happened to you? Are you hurt? No, I'm not hurt. But he nearly got me. Who? Who nearly got you? Listen, dear. I can't explain over the phone, and I don't dare go down there. Can you meet me up on deck? Yes, of course. Where? Do you know the boat deck? Boat deck? Uh, which one is that? The top deck, where all the lifeboats are slung. Oh, yes, I know it. Well, go to the starboard side. Yes. Uh, that's the right-hand side, facing yes. forward. Find the fourth lifeboat from the aft companionway. Yes. There's a thick fog and nobody will see us. Ricky. What is it? Ricky! He's gone. He's gone. Excuse me, miss, but I thought I heard somebody talking in here. Stewardess, what are you doing up at this time of the night? If I might ask, miss, what are you doing up and dressed? Oh, you ought to get some sleep, miss. You really ought. It might interest you to know, stewardess, that I've just been talking to my husband. Now, look here, miss. Don't start that all over again. Please, don't start that all over again. You all pretended to think I was mad, didn't you? And you nearly drove me mad. Ricky's beaten the whole crowd of you, and I'm going out on deck to meet him now. Out on deck, miss. That's what I said. Where's my coat? Don't go out there, miss. Not in the state of mind you're in. And the fog's are thick. You can't hardly see your hand in front of your face. Stand away from the door, please. Suppose, miss, I didn't want to let you go out there. I don't think that would matter much. You've probably heard that mad people have ten times ordinary strength, and I'm stronger than you anyway. Miss, I'm a-begging you. Stand away from that door. you? Yes. Ricky. Ricky, darling, where are you? Here. Duck your head under the lifeboat. Here, take my hand. But isn't it horribly dangerous out there on the edge? There's no no railing along the side of the ship. Don't worry, Anne. I won't let you fall. Look out! Ah! Oh, went overboard here. We're well aft near the propellers. The suction would carry into the propeller blades and... Now listen. I can't hear anything except the foghorn. Yeah, but I can. There's somebody walking along the deck. And I can see a flashlight moving in the fog. You're quite right, oh, my I... friend. You can see a flashlight moving in the fog. Dr. Heinrich, what are you doing here? At the moment, young lady, I'm covering both of you with a revolver. Please don't move. So, you were in the conspiracy, Dr. Heinrich. May I ask you what conspiracy? The whole ship's conspiracy to say Richard Brewster didn't exist. My dear young lady, you can set your mind at rest. There never was any ship's conspiracy against you. The people you spoke to were perfectly honest. Including Mr. Marshall, I suppose. Yes, including Mr. Marshall. And what is this Stand all Stand back there. I suppose he was telling the truth when he said nobody came up the gangplank before or after me. I beg your pardon. That was not what he said. He said no passenger came up the gangplank at this time. Well, what's the difference? 
A great crime is arranged for tonight, young lady. No less a crime than murder. Murder? Who's going to be murdered? You are. What? That, I repeat, is a scheme. But there is no conspiracy and only one criminal. Oh. And who is the criminal? The criminal is the man standing beside you. Your so-called husband. Ricky? You don't know what you're saying. I think I do. Marshall, of course, did see someone walk up the gangplank, loitering behind you. But he never dreamt of associating this person in any way with you. He saw a ship's officer returning from shore leave in civilian clothes. A ship's officer? Yes. The man you call your husband, his name isn't Richard Brewster. His real name is Blaney. And he's the first officer of the Moravania. Are you trying to tell the me captain that captain my... can identify him. He's actually British, though he can fake an American accent very well. He has already got a wife in England, and he's planning to join her with the $10,000 he got from you. I don't believe it. I don't. Ricky, why don't you say something? Oh, he planned it very cleverly, I must admit. He never let you know he was ship's officer, did he? He's been away for some time, naturally, so he persuaded you to marry him in a hurry. Ricky, Ricky, is this true? He has the money, you see. All he did was hang a dummy number on the cabin door, remove it later, put on his uniform, and walk away with his own luggage. But Captain Wainwright told us that the first officer had come aboard tonight with... Uh... With a bad attack of flu, yes. Our friend couldn't be seen in public until after he disposed of you. The best thing was to convince everybody you were insane, as he did. Then, when you went overboard tonight... They would all believe it was suicide. Exactly. But I began to suspect this Brewster, because you quoted him as telling such an obvious lie. He said he had never traveled in the Moravania, yet he could direct you all over the ship, and even knew where the person's office was. So I went to his cabin, found it empty, searched, and found your $10,000. Look out, Dr. Henry! Put it down, you fool, put it down! He's overboard! You shot him! You shot him! Those shots, my dear, never touched him. Never... Touched him? No. The weight of the iron carried him over backwards when he lifted it. It was the weight he was going to use to sink your body. Fishy! The propellers! Fishy's propellers! Yes, they suck you under. Oh, doctor. Doctor, I can't stand this. It won't be easy, my dear. It won't be easy, I know, but... Believe me, this... This way is better. And so closes Cabin B-13, starring Margot and Philip Dawn. Tonight's tale of suspense. With our two stars tonight were Dennis Hoy as Captain Wainwright and William Johnstone as Ricky Brewster. This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when our star will be one of the screen year's most sensational newcomers, Mr. Gene Kelly. Mr. Kelly will be supported by Hans Conried and William Johnstone. The producer and director of suspense is William Spear, who with Lud Gluskin and Lucian Morrowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. Suspense fans, please note that these programs will shortly move to different days of the week. Suspense will come to listeners in Eastern and Central time zones on Thursdays, beginning December the 2nd, and to Mountain and Pacific time zone listeners on Monday, beginning December the 6th. Remember Thursday, beginning December the 2nd, in Eastern and Central time zone, and Mondays, beginning December the 6th, in the Pacific and Mountain time zones for Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In our starring Hollywood cast tonight are Mr. John Sutton, who appears as a young English doctor, Jim Norwood, who knew a great deal more than he admitted concerning the strange events which we are about to relate. And Mr. George Zuko, who plays the village curate, the Reverend Arthur Morley. Our story, and it bears none but a coincidental resemblance to H.G. Wells' famous short novel, The Invisible Man, is by John Dixon Carr and is called The Man Without a Body, tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you. And so it is with The Man Without a Body and the performances of John Sutton and George Zuko, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! A lonely beach of low white sand hills edged by the surf of the North Sea. And back from the beach, drowsing as it has drowsed for ten centuries, lies the village of Aldbridge in Suffolk. There is the seawall, now defaced by air raid shelters. And there are the rolling grain fields, the thatched white cottages, the spire of St. Luke's Church above the oak trees. Ancient and bell-haunted, lost among hedgerows, this village could never cause consternation in London newspaper offices. And yet, on that warm night nearly four years ago... This time it's really happened. A man without a body, completely invisible. Toby boy. Tommy boy, look at this dispatch. Reign of terror in Suffolk Village. Has another of H.G. Wells' romances come true? An invisible man? I can't believe it. Uh, what's the matter with that village? They all gone scatty? Mr. George Wellman, builder, states that as he was returning home along the main road from Bury St. Edmunds... He distinctly saw a man's hat without any head under it, moving towards him about six feet above the ground. Oh, George, wasn't it going to be full of beer? We can't use this story. Coffee boy! Even more surprising evidence was given by the Reverend Arthur Morley, vicar of St. Luke's Church. Who? The parson? You don't think he was full of beer? One question above all agitates the village. Who is Professor Ansmith? Who is this elderly American, said to be an inventor, who has settled at Aldridge and leased a part of the house belonging to the local doctor? Out of some terrifying workshop, to strike like a maniac, where least expected, has there at last emerged... A real invisible man? The church of St. Luke, Aldridge, on that same Sunday evening. The evening service is over now, though an echo of bells still lingers. In the vestry at the rear of the church, where white surplices hang like ghosts... The Reverend Arthur Morley sits with his daughter, Janice. It is a stone room of painted windows, now many colored in the sunset. And here is the drowsy summer light turns to dusk. Janice, I don't believe it. I know, Father. I saw it with my own eyes, yet I don't believe it. You don't think we were dreaming, do you? No, Father. We weren't dreaming. If this goes on, the whole village will be in a frenzy. But what can I do? We could go to Professor Ansmith and ask him straight out. Ask him whether he's responsible for these... Yes. I wonder, Janice. A man isn't hurting anybody, you know. You couldn't ask for a quieter person or a better neighbor. And yet... What's that? Father, you are upset. It's only Mr. Emmett coming down from the belfry. Emmett? Oh, yes, of course. Is that you, Mr. Emmett? Uh... It's me, all right, sir. And very much in the flesh. Did, did you think I was the invisible man? Mr. Emmett, I forbid you to mention that subject. Oh, very good, sir. But there's others begging your pardon that do mention it. Oh, yes, yes. Forgive me. I spoke too sharply. Oh, that's all right, sir. No harm done. No bones broken. Mind you not that I hold with this talk about invisible men. It ain't natural, I say. It ain't hardly Christian. I'm a greengrocer by trade, and I believe in what I can weigh and feel and... Uh, What's the matter, Mr. Emmett? Is anything wrong? Excuse me, sir. And you too, miss. 
Do you see anybody in this room except us? No, of course not. Why? Because I, I could have sworn something brushed past me just now. You're imagining things, Mr. Emmett. Yes, sir, I, I dare say, There's but... There's nobody uh, hidden in the Belfry Tower, I hope. No, sir. I had a look-see. And what's more... There's not going to be anybody up there once I've locked the door. Now, let the blighter try and get in. Oh, please, Mr. Emmett. And you too, Father. You're talking about this invisible man as though, as though he actually existed. There's something funny going on, miss. You can't deny that. No, none of us can deny it. And what's more, sir, it's getting pretty dark in here. Hadn't you and Miss Janice better get along to the vicarage while I lock up? No, we can't go just yet, Mr. Emmett. We're expecting Dr. Norwood. Dr. Jim Norwood, sir? What does he say about all this? Oh, you might ask him yourself, Mr. Emmett. I think that's probably him now. Come in. The vestry door's not locked. Oh, hello, Padre. Hello, Janice. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, hello, Jim. You seem a good deal out of breath. I am out of breath, Janice, because there's blue blazes to pay down in the village. Not more trouble. Yes, I'm afraid so. They're holding a mass meeting at the Coach and Horses, and they're ready to murder Professor Ann Smith. If this invisible man cuts any more capers, we may see a real old-fashioned lynching in an English village. Now, look here, my boy. This has got to stop. I know that, Padre, but how are we going to stop it? Sit down there, Jim, across the table from me. Yes, sir. First of all, what do you know about this Professor Ann Smith? Nothing, sir. Nothing at all. But you've been part of your house to him. Oh, my dear Padre, that house is twice as big as I can possibly manage. I was only too glad to get a tenant. He gave you references, I imagine? Yes, but I didn't bother to check him. He's a quiet old boy. Pays his rent on the dot. Never does anything except read and go for long walks. Are you quite sure of that, Jim? The village has war nerves, that's all. With the camouflage aerodrome in the neighborhood, they're apt to imagine anything. True, perhaps, but... Uh... That talk about dynamos humming in the old boy's room and blue lights flashing is rubbish out of a sensational film. They imagine the whole thing. Finally, this crazy story about an invisible man playing the gramophone. Why, it's that's... It's a... not a crazy story, Jim. Janice and I saw it happen. You what? Last night, about half past nine, Janice and I were out for a walk in the lane that runs past your house. On the way, we met Willie Kendrick, and he joined us. Well, sir? Listen, Jim. On that side of the house, there's a little square room with two windows and no furniture except a round table and a couple of chairs. Do you know the one we mean? Yes, of course. Professor Ann Smith uses it. What about the room? It wasn't quite blackout time. The windows were up, the curtains weren't drawn, and the room was brightly lighted. On the table stood an old-fashioned gramophone with a horn and a crank handle. Beside it lay a pair of white cotton gloves, like, like gardener's gloves. The gramophone was playing away for dear life, but there was nobody in the room. Janice thought that was a bit odd, a gramophone going full tilt with nobody there, and called my attention to it. Just then, the gramophone started to run down. We could hear the record slow and go off key. As it did so... Well, sir, go on. As it did so, those white gloves got up off the table. Got up off the table? Got up off the table, took hold of the gramophone, and wound it up again. <laughs> Mr. Emmett, what on earth are you doing? Uh, I dropped some candlesticks. So I see. Please pick them up again. Yes, sir. Padre, are you serious? Perfectly serious. A pair of gloves without any hands inside them? Yes. But what did they do exactly? The left hand glove steadied the gramophone. The right hand glove wound it up. Then they both hung in the air, beating time to the music. It should have been funny. I can only assure you it was not funny. Oh, what happened then? Oh, Jim, it was horrible. Willie Kendrick let out a yell and ran down the lane between the apple trees as though the devil were after him. I can't say I blame him. Father and I just stood there and... and... Stared is the word, my dear. Yes, stared. I can't forget any of it. The three-legged table and the whirling record and the blue flowers on the wallpaper. But there was nobody there. We could see past the table and under the table and all over the room... And there was nobody there. Except the man without any body. Confound the man without any body. Father, suppose it is true. As a clergyman, my dear, I prefer to remain agnostic. This thing's a trick. Yes, but how is it done and why? That's the whole point, Jim. What worries me is the effect on our people here. We call ourselves intelligent and yet look at us. 
Even Mr. Emmett there. Hey, hey, what's that about me, sir? A few minutes ago, you thought something brushed past you when you were coming down the stairs from the bell tower. Now, didn't you? Well, uh, yes, sir. You see what I mean, Jim? But I didn't really think so, sir, not really. It was imagination, just like the doctor said. Because I searched that tower. I locked the door afterwards. Exactly. But the mere force of suggestion, nothing more, might lead you to believe. That's not suggestion, Father. Sir, I'll take my Bible oath. There's nobody in that belfry. Bells can't ring by themselves, old man. There's somebody pulling the rope up there, and we're going to find out who it is. Now, one moment, all of you. What's wrong, Padre? You're as white as a ghost. This blasphemous mockery, it seems, extends even to the church. Very well. You will stay with Janice, my boy. Emmett and I will collar this invisible man. Why can't I go too? I don't believe in this, but I should prefer to have someone with Janice. You're not afraid, Mr. Emmett? If, if it's alive, sir, I'm not afraid of it. And if it's dead, well, well, you're not afraid of it. The tower door's open, sir. I'm ready. Don't do it, Father. Don't go. You can't help them, Janice. Sit down here. Take it easy. Jim Norwood, what's wrong with you? Wrong with me? You've got an odd look, too. And the light's fading. And the surpluses look like ghosts. And in another minute, that bell would drive me mad. Suppose he has got in. Who? The invisible man. Oh, don't talk rot. As there are sounds that the ear cannot hear, so there are colors that the eye cannot see. I read that somewhere. He hasn't hurt anybody yet. But suppose he turns nasty and does hurt somebody. He can't hurt anybody. How do you know? Janice, listen to me. Take my hand. Oh, but Jim... I want to tell you a few things you won't understand. I don't ask you to understand. I just ask you to remember. Well, what is it? The first is a question. If you were a government official and wanted to find an expert on camouflage, where would you go? An expert on camouflage? Yes. And the second point is this. I studied medicine in Germany. Oh, I know that, but that's One quite... night on a bet, I hid backstage at the Winter Garden Theater in Berlin. I saw the whole show from backstage and... And I learned a great deal. Jim Norwood, what on earth are you talking George about? George Wellman and I have talked the whole thing over. In a way, Janice, there is an invisible man. I can tell you who he is and how he works. But there's no danger, do you understand? There's no danger at all. If... Jim, what was that? I don't know. You do know. I can see it in your face. You do know. I think somebody's Fallen? Fallen? From the top of the belfry. Oh, Father! Stay here, Janice. You can't do any good. Let go of my arm. I'm going up there. Oh, you're not. I didn't think what the danger might be. Besides, there's somebody coming down the stairs now. Stay just where you are and don't move until... Oh, Father. Father, are you all right? Steady, sir. Take it easy now. I'm perfectly all right, yes. But you'd better go into the churchyard and see to him, he... He fell? No, Janice, he did not fall. He was thrown. Oh. Thrown? By whom? There's no time to argue now. You're a doctor. Go out and see to him. Well, is he in... I don't know. Go. Yes, sir. For I will work a deed in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Janice, this is incredible. Why? You heard the bell ring. I saw it ring. Without anybody there? I was as close to that bell as I am to you now. No hand held the rope. There were no strings or wires or any tricks to make it move. Yet it clanged back and forth alone in the tower. And I thought I heard someone laugh. Laugh? Oh, don't take that too seriously. We were both overwrought and the noise of the bell was deafening. Well, what about Mr. Emmett? Emmett yelled some words I couldn't hear and lunged for the bell. Then something caught him. Something caught him and gave him a sledgehammer blow in the back. That bell is nothing but open arches. You heard him scream. I saw his face just before he went over. Lock the door to the tower, Father. Lock it. I can't lock it. Emmett has the key. But why should I lock it? Because he's still in there. He? He hadn't done any harm before, but he's done harm now. There's no telling what might happen if he gets loose. You mean? I mean Professor Ansmith's protege, whoever he is. The man without a body. Under the red sunset, some quarter of a mile away, a grass-carpeted lane winds between rows of apple trees. The lane is dusky. Though lights shine into it from the windows of a large stone house. Dr. Norwood's house beyond the apple trees. 
Up and down. Up and down a shadowy figure is pacing. An elderly figure. A dejected figure. Tall and frail as a shadow among shadows. Muttering to itself. Shaking its head. Now and then raising one fist in bewilderment or anguish. Sometimes the light gleams on large spectacles and a kindly mouth. Up and down. Endlessly up and down strides Professor Ansmith. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. How can I convince them that I'm not guilty? Who's there? I saw you dodge behind that tree. S stand out, sir. Uh, did you call me Professor Ansmith? Yes, I did call you. Who are you? You probably won't recognize me, Professor Einstein. Nevertheless, my friend, may I ask what your name is? Uh, my name is Wellman, Professor George Wellman. Wellman, Wellman. I've heard that name. Maybe you have. I'm a builder by trade and a great friend of Dr. Norwood's. Wait one moment. Aren't you the young man whose firm is putting up these air raid shelters along the seawall? And making such an unholy din with your riveting machines? That's me. And come to think of it, aren't you the one who first started this alarm about an invisible man? Yes, because I met him. You did not meet him, sir. This whole thesis is scientific nonsense. And I won't have it. Uh, you won't have what? I'm an old man, Mr. Wellman. I never did anybody the least harm. As God is my judge, I know nothing whatever about this, this... What's that? It looks like the vicar's car, Professor. You'd better stand back. This is a pretty narrow lane. Ansmith. Professor Ansmith. Yes, Mr. Morley, I hear you. We thought you'd better drive over here straight away. I, I think you've met my daughter. And, of course, you know Dr. Norwood. Yes, but there's no time for any social formalities. Get into your house, Professor Ansmith. Get in quickly and close the shutters. But why should I do that? Because there's a mob coming, sir, and we can't stop them. Hurry, do hurry. A mob coming here? Why? Haven't you heard the news? I've heard nothing, my friend. The only person I've seen has been that young man there who chews a toothpick and hides behind the trees. George Wellman? What on earth are you doing here? Uh, watching, Janice. Watching and waiting, just as usual. Listen to me, Professor Ansmith. Henry Emmett, the head verger at St. Luke's, was thrown from the belfry window not 20 minutes ago. Not by me, sir, I assure you. I had nothing to do with no, it. No, not by you, but apparently by the invisible man. Oh, Father in heaven, will this never stop? Not till we catch the fellow. No, be quiet, Mr. Bowman, please. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Padre, I take it back. I myself can testify that no visible person laid hands on Emmett. He was struck, struck as though with a gigantic fist. What's the matter, Professor Ansmith? Is anything wrong? No, 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 no. I, I, I was just thinking. Is Emmett dead? Fortunately, no. I'm glad of that, my friend, for a certain person's sake. He's not even seriously hurt. The bell tower isn't high and a tree broke the force of his fall. But he's badly shaken up. And that crowd of the coach and horses means trouble. If you haven't anything to say to us, if you haven't a word of explanation to utter... Listen, Padre, don't you hear anything? Yes, I thought I heard voices. Can't be that crowd from the village. We're too far ahead of them. It's a crowd, all right. And they've been here for hours. But where? I don't see anybody. Jim, look, behind the trees. Look behind the trees. Look be beyond the hedgerows. Look for any place where a watcher can hide. And may I ask what they're doing here? They're watching you, Professor Ansmith. Uh, more of your spies, you mean? You can call them anything you please. But they're getting impatient and they want to show down. If I as much as hold my hand up like this... <laughs> Don't throw stones at the windows, you fool! You're only breaking the doctor's window! Gentlemen, I can't have any more of this. Be quiet, all of you, and listen to me. Well, sir, we're listening. I'm a peaceful man. I like to live in peace with my neighbors. I have nothing to do with this so-called reign of terror... But you don't believe that, do you? No. Then I must expose a fraud. Now, don't blame me if I expose the trickster, too. I have made preparations to show you 
the invisible man. The man without a body. Quiet, everybody. Mr. Morley, I believe you and your daughter walked through this lane last night uh, while I was away at the Berry St. Edmunds. I don't know about your being away, sir. My daughter and I were certainly here, yes. Good, good. Miss Janice Morley. Yes, Professor Ansmith. Will you look toward your right, please, at the house? What do you see? It's the same room. What room? The room with the little round table and the gramophone. It's a three-legged table, you notice. Yes, of course. But there's nobody in the room. No, nobody at all. Are conditions exactly as they were last night? Yes, except there aren't any gloves on the table. No, but the invisible man is there. Oh. A living presence, ready to act and breathe and even kill. Even kill? With your permission, I shall now address him. Hello in there. Hello in there. Hello in there. If anybody answers him, Father, I'm going to scream. Quiet, Janice, quiet. Father, look. The gloves are appearing on the table. I call out to him and I speak as follows. Hold the phonograph with your left glove. That's it. Turn the handle with your right. One turn... Two, three, four, that's enough. Touch the spring with your left hand. Push the record. Lower the needle with your right and... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the invisible man. Because then they'll see the trick. I don't follow you. What trick? The trick of the looking glasses. There. You see now, my friend? I think I do. The legs of the table form a triangle with its point towards you. Panels of looking glass are fitted in the two sides facing you. What do you know about that? You think you can see under the table, but what you actually see are the side walls of the room reflected in those two mirrors. Oh, oh, wait a minute. You mean... I mean that my old servant, hidden behind the mirrors, has just been working the gloves to a panel in the tabletop. It's a very old trick, first shown by Colonel Stadare at the London Polytechnic. And that's what happened last night? Yes. And you had nothing to do with it? Nothing whatever, nor had my servant. Then who did do it and why? What is the explanation of all this? Well, I can't tell you why. That's what beats me. But I can tell you everything else. This invisible man who's been scaring us all silly? My dear young lady, there's no invisible man. There never has been. I might believe that, Professor Ansmith, if I hadn't seen a church bell ringing where there was no hand to ring it. And poor old Emmett flung out of the tower as though a giant hand had got hold of him. You're not saying that was done with the looking glasses? No, my friend, not at all. That was really clever. Strings? Wires, ropes? No, they weren't necessary. But the thing's impossible. Oh, no. The same principle was used by my old friend J.N. Maskelyne to make mechanical figures work. Psycho played whist, and Zoe drew pictures. I myself, I... Go on, sir. You yourself, what are you going to say? Uh, The secret I was about to say remains unknown even today. You were right, in a way, when you tell us that Emmett acted as though a giant had got hold of him. A giant had got hold of him. At least, a gigantic force. Oh, before we all go completely mad, would you mind telling us what this gigantic force was? Not at all. It was compressed air. Compressed air? But don't you see it even yet, any of you? No. A compressed air pipe with a thousand pounds pressure behind it was run up into the tower facing the bell. It could be operated from the ground outside. The pressure was turned on and off in bursts. It made that heavy bell swing like a toy. Emmett, don't you remember? Emmett rushed forwards towards the bell. And the air pressure? The air pressure struck him like a sledgehammer and flung him headlong out of the tower. There's your miracle, gentlemen. 
That's all there was to it. Oh, don't believe it. Sir, I can't doubt what you say. It's too circumstantial and too right. But, but what, my friend? The compressed air tanks. The mechanical apparatus to work this trick. Well, what about it? Well, where did it come from? Such things don't grow on bushes. No, but they do grow on riveting machines. Riveting machines? Yes, such as the riveting machine they're using on the air raid shelters along the seawall. Would you care to tell us, Dr. James Norwood, why you and your friend Wellman have been playing all these tricks? <laughs> Jim Norwood, is this true? Why, of course it's true, Mr. Morley. Don't be so gullible. Jim and George Wellman doing all this? I don't believe it. Take a look at their faces, young lady. Did you ever see a guiltier-looking pair? So we look guilty, do we? Frankly, you do. We played the whole game and convinced the village there was an invisible man. Is that it? Yes. You worked the glove trick in your own house. And Wellman worked the air trick with his own equipment. Everything else was nothing but a pack of lies and a lot of atmosphere. Playing conjurers and making a blasted hash of it. Is that all, Professor Ann Smith? Well, remember, you brought this on yourself. I didn't want to expose you. No, Professor. I bet you didn't. Easy, George. Take it easy. Jim, is this true? Before you start pitching into me, Janice, let me have my word first. Do you remember what I said to you at the church tonight? At the church? Yes, I asked you to remember something, even if you didn't understand it. All right. Can you remember what it was? Oh, Jim, please. You're only trying to evade this. Oh, I, I'm so confused now, I don't remember anything. All I can think of is this horrible business and what's behind it. Father can't believe his ears, and I'm not much better. We've practically idolized you. All we want you to do is answer a straight question. Jim, are these accusations true? Yes, they are true. <laughs> Doubtless he had a good reason, Janice. Doubtless he had a good reason. Yes, we had a good reason. The very best reason in the world. You had a good reason for scaring people half to death and trying to kill poor old Henry Emmett? We didn't mean any harm against Emmett. That was an accident. But you dare to defend yourself now? Yes, just that. Before we go home, Father... Shall we apologize to Professor Ann Smith? I hope he'll try to think better of English hospitality. Good, Janice, good. I hope he will, too. You hope he will. Listen, Janice, before you act on any belief, you have to be absolutely sure in your own mind. George and I have to prove something. And now I'm glad to say we have proved it. Oh, I can't stand this any longer. If you have anything to say, go on and say it straight out. What was it you had to prove? We had to prove to our own satisfaction that this pretended American who calls himself Professor Ann Smith... Pretended American? Who calls himself Professor Ann Smith? We had to prove that this pretended American was no other than Karl Heinrich von Keist, the celebrated oh. stage magician from the Winter Garden Theater in Berlin. What? Whose real job is to find the camouflage aerodrome near Berry St. Edmunds. No. He explained his own tricks very nicely, George. We'll swear out a warrant in the morning. And so closes The Man Without a Body, starring John Sutton and George Zuko. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, The Man in Black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when the distinguished actress, Miss Agnes Moorhead, will be heard in one of her many brilliant characterizations. Starring with Miss Moorhead will be Miss Ellen Drew, who as Carol Linden tells the amazing story of Uncle Henry's Rosebush. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear with Ted Bliss, the director, Bernard Herman and Lucian Mahowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our starring Hollywood cast this evening is Mr. Paul Lucas. And with him are Miss Heather Angel and Mr. Bramwell Fletcher. Story by John Dixon Carr, dealing with strange, very strange happenings in a London curio shop and called Mr. Markham, Antique Dealer, is tonight's tale of suspense. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution till the last possible moment. And so, with the performances of Heather Angel, Bramwell Fletcher, and Paul Lucas as Mr. Markham, antique dealer, we again hope to keep you in suspense. This is the story of a man who commits murder and gets away with it. Does the idea shock you? Do you believe that justice must always be done? But let's be honest with ourselves. You and I needn't be cynics to know that justice is very seldom done. Innocence flinches. Guilt is childlike and bland. Innocence is imposed upon. Guilt can impass, encompass all things, even a successful murder. And I know this because I was the murderer, you say? <laughs> oh, no. Inquire at Scotland Yard. I was the victim. In Barn Street, not far from Piccadilly, there used to be an establishment, which in a less fashionable part of town would have been called a shop. On the windows, in letters as discreet as a visiting card, were the words, Charles Markham, antique dealer. Such a delightful fellow, Markham. Such a character. Thirty years ago, yes, as long as that, this antique shop was a dingy place, despite deep carpets and crystal chandeliers. It rustled with the ticking of a hundred clocks. It was shadowed by damascened armor and the loom of tall tapestries. And late one summer night, when the shutters were long closed on those windows, a four-wheeler drew up before the door in the gas-lit street. That's all, Cabby. You needn't wait. Very good, miss. Good night. Good night. He must be here. He must be. I won't go back to that place. I'll kill myself first. Oh, look here, old man. You needn't be... Oh, I beg your pardon. And I beg yours. I'm... I'm not the person you were expecting, am I? No, madam. As a matter of fact, I was expecting a police officer. A police officer? Oh, merely an old friend who often drops in for a talk and a drink. You are Mr. Markham, aren't you? Yes, my name is Markham. Can I be of any service to you? I want to come in. I... I... Uh, I want to buy a present for somebody. Now, really, madam, this is hardly the time. Yes, I... I know it's late, but... It's nearly one o'clock, madam. Surely tomorrow morning will be... That'll be too late. This is a special occasion. It's... It's uh, a birthday present. That's it. A birthday present. I've got to deliver it before breakfast. And uh, Sir George Lytle says this is the only place in London to buy antiques. Oh, Sir George flatters me. Won't you let me come in? Uh, just for five minutes. Well, under the circumstances, madam, I think it might be managed. Now, one moment while I put some lights on. No, please. That one little light will be enough. But you won't be able to see anything. That doesn't matter. I... I'll trust to your judgment. Just as you like. This way, madam. What's that? That noise? Oh, you mean the clocks, madam? <laughs> there are more than a hundred clocks in this room. I'm very fond of them. Don't they get on your nerves? Ticking away together like a nightmare? Striking the hours together? They don't strike together, madam. When the hour approaches, you will hear a musical din that lasts for some time. Might I interest you perhaps in a clock? No. I hate them. <laughs> now, all the same, this grandfather clock might amuse you. What about it? Observe the signature. Johannes Carver, Londini, Facet A.D., 
1752. Uh, you could see better, madam, if you raise that veil. I'll keep my veil down, thanks. Uh, just as you please. But look at the clock. I open the glass face like this. Then I push the second hand forward like this and... that voice. Only the clock, madam. Nothing more. The clock spoke. <laughs> Clever, isn't it? The device of old John Carver. Anticipating Mr. Edison's gramophone by more than a hundred years. Oh, but you don't like clocks. No. Uh, may I ask whether the present is for a lady or a gentleman? It's uh, for a man. Oh, has he some knowledge of antiques? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean... Uh, furniture, perhaps. Porcelain, bronzes, tapestries, weapons... He might be very much interested in weapons. Uh, then yes. I imagine his name is Mr. Ronald Gilbert. Now, will you tell me, Miss Ray, why you really came here tonight? So you know who I am. Naturally. You are Miss Judith Ray. And why did you come here? I wanted to see what sort of a man you actually were. Oh, and have you found out? No, but... But I won't go back to prison. I won't. As you will. But since it's to be a business conference, Miss Ray, and I imagine it is. Yes. Well, then suppose we go into my office, here at the back of the shop. Will you precede me? Thank you. Oh, you must excuse the dust covers I've put on the chairs here. I'm leaving for a holiday tomorrow, and the shop will be closed. When I return next week, Miss Ray, I shall expect the amount requested. In cash, of course. But I can't raise 2,000 pounds. You ought to know that. Well, your fiancé could raise the money, I imagine. Ron? Do you think I'd have Ron know where I've been? Or what I've been? It's better than having his father learn it, surely. Now, sit down, Miss Ray. I'd rather stand, thank you. <laughs> now, that's a very foolish gesture. But the ladies will do it. They think it gives them dignity and shows the disdain of the poor blackmailer. You see, I make no bones about it. I am a blackmailer. You seem rather proud of yourself. Why not? I am the one person in England, perhaps in the world, who has made it a large-scale business. Congratulations. <laughs> and what is all life but, but blackmail? The child says, if you don't give me that, I'll scream. The grown woman says, if you go on behaving like this, I will leave you. Your sex, Miss Ray, are blackmailers from the cradle. You know, Charles Markham, I wonder... Yes? I wonder if anybody's ever hurt you very much. Hurt me? What do you mean? When you talk about the world and people in general, your face goes white under the eyes. You pick up that letter opener from the desk. Not a letter opener, please, Miss Ray. A Medici dagger. 16th century work. It isn't the money that really interests you. I it? don't understand. You hate the world. You just want to torture people, but you think you've been tortured. Isn't that so? This is a very sharp dagger, Miss Ray. If I throw it down on the desk, it sticks. Like isn't, that. Isn't it so, Charles Markham? My motives, Miss Ray, aren't in question. I wonder... Whereas your motives are. Now, let me see. Ten years ago, in 1903, a certain girl called Letty Wilson, your real name, I believe, fell in love with a rather contemptible underworld character named Arthur Aker. Please! No humiliation was too great for her. She worked for him, lied for him, stole for him. I was only 18. I didn't know what I was now, doing. this girl, for a very shabby theft, was sentenced to three years' hard labor at Holloway Prison. Five months later, she escapes from prison and disappears. All these years afterwards, she appears in the West End as Miss Judy Trey, fashionable milliner. Haven't I made up for it? Haven't I? No. For one mistake. After ten years. It's the way of the world, my dear. I didn't create it. And I'm forgetting the best part of the comedy. This paragon of virtue next falls in love with Mr. Ronald Gilbert, son of Major General Sir Edmund Gilbert. Such a respectable family, too. Stop it, please. Then, shall we say... 2,000 pounds. Suppose I did raise the money. I don't know how, but suppose I did raise it. Well? What guarantee would I have that you wouldn't ask for still more money? I probably shall ask for more money, Miss Ray. But well, that's my privilege as a blackmailer. Then... Then I'm never going to be free of you. Is that it? Well, frankly, that's it. Ah. Unless I kill you, of course. What if I did kill you? <laughs> People have threatened it before. But they haven't meant it. Maybe I mean it. Well, we can easily test you out. There's a sharp knife stuck in the desk in front of you. 
I'm going to get up and deliberately turn my back on you. Like this. Be careful, Charles Markham. As a student of human nature, I'm curious. How much will you risk to keep this secret? Have you the courage to kill and risk hanging? Yes. I think I have. What was that? Now, aren't you glad you held back at the last moment, Miss Ray? I said, what was that? That, my dear, was the front doorbell. Probably my friend, Inspector Ross, from Bigmore Street Police Station. Come in, old man. Come on in. Make yourself comfortable. I'll be with you in a moment. You wanted me to attack you, didn't you? No, I was merely curious. And in any case, Miss Ray, it would be useless to kill me. Useless? Why? Because I shouldn't die. Don't talk rot. Oh, it's quite true. A man in my position must take uh, certain precautions. If you killed me, I should be back to haunt you within half an hour. And I don't happen to be joking. Come in. Don't look here, Martha. I... Good Lord, Judy. Ron. Mr. Ronald Gilbert, as I live. Ron, what are you doing here? He hasn't got anything against you, has he? Speak up, Mr. Gilbert. Have I? The fact is, Judith, I... I... <laughs> Look at him, Miss Ray. See how he changes color and twists his mustache and altogether resembles a boy caught in his mother's gem cupboard. Perfect picture of a gentleman being a gentleman. Look here, Markham. I'm not very clever. You can always make a fool of me when you start talking. So let's stop talking. I brought the money. What money? Oh, merely my fee for keeping quiet about you. So you went to Ron, too. You told him about it. Naturally. If possible, always sell your wares in two markets. How much money? Never mind, Judith. I hoped I could do this without your knowing. How much money? Three thousand. It's all I could raise. Has he... Has he told you who I am and what I've been? Look here, Judith. Who the devil cares who you are or what you've been? I happen to be in love with you. I... Never mind. Let's get out of here. Ron, it's no good. He'll only come back for more money. I know that, but what else can we do? Nothing, I'm afraid. Well, what's that knife doing there stuck in the desk? Nothing dangerous, I assure you. No? Merely a curio. I pick it up like this, I flip it down like this, and pick it up again. Miss Ray was very much interested in the dagger. Now, may I have that envelope with the money, please? There you are. Take it. Thank you. As I explained to Miss Ray, I'm leaving tomorrow for a holiday. Hence the general disarray and the dust covers on the chairs... But before my departure, I'm glad we could settle this affair, as you would say, like gentlemen. Before we clear out of here, Markham, there's just one favor I'd like to ask. Well, of course, old man, ask away. This is your job, I suppose. You can't help being what you are, but never again, as long as you live... Well? Never even say the word, gentlemen. Be careful, Ron. Look at his face. Tell me, Mr. Gilbert, how much money is in this envelope? You heard what I said, 3,000 pounds. Then take it back, my friend. I find we can't strike a bargain after all. What do you mean? Just what I say. Here is your money. You will now oblige me, both you and Miss Ray, by leaving my shop. But what are you going to do? Tomorrow morning, perhaps even tonight, I'm going to get in touch with the police. And I shall tell them where they can find Letty Wilson, alias Judith Ray. You can't do that, Markham. Oh, yes, he can. You hit him where it hurts. Three thousand pounds, my friend, is not enough compensation for the way you talk. There is a way through the shop. Shall I escort you to the front door? No. Oh, so you prefer to stay here and make a fool of yourself? You're not going to tell the police, Markham. I promise you that. And how are you going to stop me? With this. Run! Put that gun away. It's a funny thing, Judith. I felt a bit of a fool, you know, bringing this revolver along. But now I've got a use for it. Oh, yes, I've got a use for it. Oh. Maybe the best thing would be to go into the street now and call a policeman. You will never get into the street, Markham. Are you following me into the shop? Yes. So both of you, it appears, came here under false pretenses. You said you wanted to pay me some money. The money's still here, but you've lost your chance to and get it. And your our dear Judith said she wanted to buy a present for you. I showed her this grandfather clock here, this talking clock. Don't go a step beyond that clock, Markham. I warn you. Nonsense, old man. You wouldn't dare shoot. Wouldn't I? No, and I'll call your bluff. One step. Two steps. John! I know your whole silly tribe, my friend. You wouldn't risk it. No, you wouldn't. What's happening to me? Don't try and grab another clock, Markham. It won't save you. You wouldn't risk your life, you... 
wouldn't risk your family position, you... You wouldn't... You... Don't you see, I had to do it. Did you... Is he... Oh, yes. Yes, he's done for. I tell you, I had to do it. Shh. Keep your voice down. Why? That shot sounded like the crack of doom. I wonder if anybody in the street heard it. You mean the police? Yes, Ron. What in heaven's name are we going to do? Steady, steady. We'll find a way out. Maybe he's not dead, Ron. Go and look at him. He's dead, all right. Please, Ron. Go and look at him. Well? Shot through the heart. The bullet went clean through him and smashed the face of the grandfather clock. That's all I can see in this dim light. This isn't happening to us. It, it can't be I've happening. I've got to think, but it's hard to think. You see, Judith, I'm not in a rage any longer. I'm just numb and, and a little bit scared. You're not going to give yourself up. And have this whole thing made public? Not likely. Wait a minute. There may be a way out. What way? He said he was going for a holiday, remember? Well, suppose he did. That gives us time. It means his absence won't be noticed. The shop will be closed. Nobody will come here for days. And certainly nobody will come here tonight. And... What's that? The police officer. I forgot the police officer. What police officer? A friend of Markham's. Inspector somebody or other from Wigmore Street. He's inspected here tonight. Then, then we're finished. No, Ronnie. We're not finished. He can't see anything out there. The shutters are down and the door's covered. Could you... Could you pick Markham up and carry him? Yes, yes, I could. Why? There must be a back way out of the shop, probably in the office. Hurry, Ron. I don't like to touch him. Hurry, Ron, please. He, he's as heavy as a sack of meal. He seems to be looking straight at me. I know. Everything here seems to have eyes and move a little in the shadow. Didn't you see the expression in Markham's eyes just before you... No, no, I, I didn't. He seemed to be looking behind us. Or beyond us. I don't know how to describe it. And he said something, too, that scared me. He's, he said he couldn't die. He's, he said... Close the door, quick. This police officer, Judith, he can't get into the shop, can he? Of course he can. The front door isn't locked. That's true. What's wrong with me, Judith? I came in there that way myself. And there's no time to lock the front door now. Our only hope is through the back way. I thought I'd seen a back door and... Ah, there it is. Just a minute. I've, I've killed a man. That means I'm a murderer. A fraction of a second. One tick of a clock in there. And you change from an ordinary happy person into... Into what I... Well, Judith, well? I'm sorry, Ron. The door's locked. Isn't there a key? No. Maybe in his pockets on a key ring. There isn't time, Ron. I think I... I heard the front door open. Our visitor's coming in. I've got it. The dust covers. What? Those white cloths that, that cover, that fit over the chairs. Look at them. What on earth are you talking about? We used to play a game when we were kids. Somebody sits in a big chair, you know. You, you, you fit the dust cover over him and, and nobody can tell he's sitting there. Don't you see, Judith? That's how we can hide Markham's body. It might work if there's time. There's got to be time. Take the big cover off that chair, the wing chair. All right. Maybe there's a chance. I'll fit him into it. Arms along the chair arms. Feet pushed back. <sighs> now... Put the cover back again and, and pull it round down his feet. Don't let it touch his chest. The blood will show through. There, that's got it. You can't see anything now, can you? No, but Ron. Well? What did you do with the gun? The gun? The gun you shot Markham with. Oh, well, Judith, I put it down on the floor when I picked up his body. Out in the other room? Yes, yes, I'm afraid so. Uh, and it's too late now, Judith. The police are here. What are you going to say? I, I don't know. Trust your wits and try and brazen it out. Yes? Come in. Good evening, Miss Ray. And good evening, Mr. Gilbert. Charles Markham? You're Charles Markham? Correct, Miss Ray. But why should that surprise you? Why do you look as though you were seeing a ghost? Because we are seeing a ghost. If you're Charles Markham, whose body is... Judith, be careful. Body, Miss Ray. Did you say body? Miss Ray's upset. She doesn't know what she's talking about. 
If you killed me, I should be back to haunt you within half an hour. That's what he said. I tell you, Miss Raisin herself, she, she, she had bad news today. A relative of hers died. I, I, I've been trying to make her feel better. Indeed. Do you think uh, it would make her feel better to bring her here? I, I don't understand. My dear sir, you are very welcome. But the situation is surely a little odd. I come in here and find you two looking as guilty as a pair of murderers if in my private office in the middle of the night. There's nothing odd about that. I, I wanted to buy you did something. It's one o'clock in the morning. Yes. Why not? Well, may I ask how you managed to get in? The front door was open. We just walked in. If you wish to buy something, why not stay in the showroom? Why come to my office? Well, hang it all. You don't think I, we, we wanted to steal anything, do you? Well, that thought did occur to me. You see, there was nobody else here. There's nobody here, Mr. Markham. Not a living soul. Then you didn't meet, by any chance, my brother? Your... your brother? Yes, my brother Robert. You couldn't have mistaken him if you had seen him. He looks so much like me that few people can tell us apart. Oh, so that's it. Poor Robert often deputizes for me. He's learned to act like me, think like me, and talk like me. But he doesn't like the work very much. Of course, you know what my work really is. Is, is this part of the game? Are you, are you trying to play cat and mouse? Robert is an idealist. He thinks, poor fellow, that my profession is beneath contempt. But he acts the part and acts it well because I pay him. And I find it useful to have a double who will run risks for me. What have you done with his body? We, we haven't done anything with him. If you've killed Robert, my friend, you've committed a totally useless murder. You don't see him here, do you? No, but I see his handiwork. Meaning what? I've warned him many times about throwing a knife down on a polished desktop. Those scratches on the desk are fresh scratches. Of course, if you give me your word of honor that he's not here... Of course he, he's not here. Well, in that case, all we can do is sit down and make ourselves comfortable. Will you sit there, Mr. Gilbert? And you, Miss Ray, uh, in that wing chair by the window. What's wrong, Miss Ray? Why don't you sit down? Because I... I prefer to stand, thank you. Then perhaps you won't mind if I sit in the wing chair. It's a very comfortable one. My brother always don't, has... Don't sit down there for the life. Oh. <laughs> so that's it. Yes. That's it. It is rather a thick chair. I press against the dust cover and blood comes through. I lift the bottom of the dust cover and... What's the use of going on with this? I killed him. You admit that? Yes, I admit it. But Judith had nothing to do with this. I swear she hadn't. My telephone, you notice, is against the wall. I shall have to turn my back to you when I ring. Ring? Where? Bigmore Street Police Station. Oh, no. Give him a chance. Please give him a chance. Hello? Hello, operator. I want Regent 0586. I yes, won't sir. let them take you on. I won't. It's no good, Judith. I killed a man. I meant to kill him. That's all there is to it. A very sensible attitude, my friend. And if the lady has any idea of flying at me with that knife, just notice what I've got here. A thirty-two revolver. One chamber fired. Picked up of the floor in that room where... Hello? Uh... Hello, Wickmore Street Police Station. For the last time, Hello? Mr. Markham, won't you give him a chance? Be quiet, Miss Ray. May I speak to Inspector Ross, please? Inspector Ross speaking. Now, isn't that Mr. Markham? Got it in one, Inspector. Uh, Charles Markham here. I understand you were going to drop in and see me tonight. Well, I intended to, Mr. Markham, but I'm afraid I can't make it now. Oh, why not? Anything wrong? Oh, near robbery in Davies Street, but it's likely to be a long job. Sorry I can't get there. Well, that's perfectly all right, Inspector, because actually I rang up to make sure you wouldn't come here tonight. You see, I've got a lot of work to do, and I'm leaving for Eastbourne early tomorrow morning. Let's make it some other time, shall we? Oh, glad to, Mr. No crimes being committed up your way, I suppose? No, Inspector. It's as quiet as the grave. I've never known a more peaceful night. Goodbye. Why did you do that? Now, please, don't excite yourself, Miss Ray. Didn't you hear what I told the Inspector? Yes, but... Is this some more trickery? Trickery? How can it be? I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. I should call it generous when I let my... Poor brother's death go unavenged. You're not doing this without a reason. Naturally not. But has it occurred to you, either of you, that it... I might not want my business dealings revealed in court. What are you driving at? And has it also occurred to you that a man's double, who looks exactly like him, and shares all his secrets, may become a danger rather than an asset? 
He knows too much. He wants too much, and so... I think I understand. You're glad he's dead. Not glad, my dear. You shocked my brotherly feelings, but definitely relieved. Look here, you can't get away with this. Get away with it, sir? Aren't you forgetting that you are the murderer? Then what are you going to do? Oh, it is very simple. We three, in an unholy partnership, will dispose of Robert's body. Or would you rather hang? He's got us, Ron. There's no other way. But how can we dispose of the body? This seems worse than killing him. It's filthy, cold-blooded... Practical necessity. And as for disposing of the body, nothing is easier. We shall simply gather the... And so, as I said before, this is the story of a man who commits murder and gets away with it. Now, Ronald Gilbert looks back across the years and is still firmly convinced of his own guilt. But, of course, Gilbert never shot anybody. I was the man who committed the murder. Don't you remember? The bullet that killed my brother is supposed to have passed through his body and smashed the face of the grandfather clock. But that's an impossibility. The face of a grandfather clock is much higher than the heart of a man. You see, two shots were fired at the very same instant. Gilbert missed and smashed the clock face. I fired from the door of the office and did not miss. That was why my brother looked past those two. I went out by the back door, locked it, and reappeared at the front afterwards. It was not Robert Markham who died. I am Robert Markham. It was Charles who died that night. And I killed him to stop forever the wholesale blackmail that was poisoning the lives and blasting the hearts of a thousand half-crazed people. His records I destroyed, his correspondence I burned. He is dead and gone. I have assumed his name and identity ever since. I committed a murder. And yet, if you sat on a jury, dare you say that you would condemn me? Come now. Would you? So closes Mr. Markham, Antique Dealer, starring Paul Lucas with Heather Angel and Bramwell Fletcher. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, when we will have the pleasure of bringing you Mr. Charles Lawton and Miss Elsa Lanchester will star in one of the most famous and suspenseful of Agatha Christie's thrillers, The ABC Murders. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Morrowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our starring Hollywood cast this evening is Mr. Richard Dix, who appears as a United States naval officer, who found himself in a remarkable predicament on what should have been an uneventful flight from New York to Philadelphia. As fellow passengers aboard the airliner are Miss Gail Page as a girl named Monica and Mr. Montague Love, who plays that aged and domineering millionaire Silas Naylor. A story by John Dixon Carr called Death Flies Blind is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, 
You will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion, dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with Death Flies Blind and the performances of Richard Dix, Gail Page, Montague Love and our other players, we again hope to keep you in suspense. LaGuardia Field, Municipal Airport of New York. LaGuardia Field, vast behind its white buildings. On a gray spring afternoon when rain splashes across the runways, dims the sky, and spatters on the wings of a great silver-painted airliner waiting beyond. Already as the limousine bus from the New York terminus slowly draws up to the waiting shed, you can hear the loud speaker. 72, New York to Los Angeles. The big limousine bus besides its driver contains only two persons. One is a tall young man in United States Naval uniform with the stripes of a lieutenant commander around his sleeve. The other is a tall and dark-haired girl with a face a little frightened in the blue. Flight 72, New York to Los Angeles. Plane ready to take off at gate number six. Have your tickets ready, please. Fred, that, that can't mean us. Now, take it easy, Monica. We're not too late. They won't go without us. No, I mean it says New York to Los Angeles. That's right, Monica. We're only going to Philadelphia. You're still right, my dear. I arranged for a special stop at Philadelphia. It won't take long, and then they go on nonstop from there. Fred, that's just it. Who's going on from there? Oh, you'd be surprised. But the airport bus must hold 20 people, but there's nobody in it except ourselves and the driver. Who's going on to Los Angeles or, or anywhere else? I uh, was going to tell you about that, Monica. Uh... All right, miss. All right, sir. Hop under that shed and out the door on the other side. Oh, uh, got your tickets ready? Yes, I've got them. All set, Monica? The rain is certainly coming down. Do they take off when it rains like this? Oh, I'd miss a little rain don't bother them. What does bother them is the unsettled weather at other places. You mean it's, it's perfectly safe? They never take off, miss, unless it is safe. You better hurry up now. There's the plane, Monica. Shall we run for it? Fred, I'd rather not run if you don't mind. Aren't getting nervous, are you? No. I know it's stupid of me. I've flown before. It's just all those few seconds before the takeoff. You're moving and the motors have been idling. All of a sudden they start to roar. The plane races ahead and the roar gets louder and suddenly you think, am I ever going to get down alive? Now look here, my dear. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Fred. I'm... There's nothing to worry about, you know. Of course not. I'll be good. It's just this dismal day and ghostly bus without any passengers. Fred... Look. Where? At the plane. They've got all the windows covered inside with a little gray curtain. Oh, that's all right, Monica. It's only a wartime measure. Wartime measure? Yes. Just keep those curtains closed for some minutes after taking off and before landing. So no one can make maps or take pictures of our airports. Oh. Anything could happen up there, Colonel. No. And what's more, if you're worried about your fellow passengers, look over your shoulder. Well, there are some people coming through the gate. Yes, you see the little gray-haired man with the big fellow on each side of him? The secretary dashing around them like a destroyer in a convoy? You know, I've seen that gray-haired man somewhere before. You've seen his picture? That's Silas Naylor, the third richest man in the world. Those two big fellows are his bodyguard. Does he need a bodyguard? Well, I... Not more than most of us, I imagine. I don't like it. Oh, nonsense, my dear. Come on now, up the steps of the plane... Give your name to the air hostess at the door. That's it. Good afternoon, miss. May I have your name, please? Uh, I'm, um, I'm Monica Vale. You're the air hostess? That's right, Miss Vale. Take any seat you like. And you, sir? Onslow, Lieutenant Commander Fred Onslow. Oh, yes, Commander. We've had instructions about you. Happy to have you with us, even if it's only as far as Philadelphia. Thank you. May I take your overcoat or your briefcase? Only the overcoat, please. I'll keep the briefcase. Fred, look there. What is it now? That man you called Mr. Naylor's secretary. Light-haired man, rather good-looking. He's sprinting towards this plane as fast as he can run. Well, you'd better be careful on that slippery surface. He certainly has. Air hostess, air hostess, air hostess, Look out, man. Watch your step. Look out. Are you all right? Here, let me help you up. I'm all right, thanks. Perfectly all right. Air hostess. Yes, sir. Uh, My name is Michael Shepard. I'm Mr. Naylor's secretary, and I think there must be some mistake here. Mistake, sir? Yes. 
when Mr. Naylor travels, he's in the habit of booking every seat in the plane to ensure privacy. Yet we seem to have two extra passengers. Well, I'm afraid that's my fault, Mr. Shepard. Indeed, sir. Then would you and the young lady be good enough to take some later flight? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't do that. No, and why not? Maybe I ought to explain, Mr. Shepard, that Commander Onslow had last-minute orders to join his ship. He and Miss Vale have priority as far as Philadelphia. Philadelphia? Must we stop there? Only for a few minutes, Mr. Shepard. This is outrageous. Mr. Naylor is traveling, uh, in a sense, on government business. Well, so am I, old man. The Navy he often does. Uh... That doesn't alter the principle of the thing. I, I don't want to seem ungracious, you understand. Mr. Naylor is always glad to help our, our brave soldiers and oh, sailors. Oh, love of my Fred. Now, the choir will now sing hymn number 242. Now the gorgeous But this ride. time you've gone too far. I shall appeal to Mr. Naylor himself. Mr. Naylor, Mr. Naylor. Yes, Mr. Shepard, I can hear you. What is it? Uh, this naval officer, sir, and the young lady. Oh, I know, Shepard, I know. Isn't the plane big enough for all of us? I was only following your orders, Mr. Naylor. You asked for privacy. All right, Shepard. What I'm asking for now is less noise. The lieutenant commander in the Navy, eh? That's right, Mr. Naylor. Off on another fishing trip, I suppose. That's just exactly right, sir. Ever have to step you? No, never. Well, I have. 20000 a year I paid pay doctors. And what do they give me? The stump. I'm not surprised you got priority, Commander. But I am a little surprised about the girl. She's my fiance, Mr. Naylor, Miss Vale. Meet the rest of my family. These two bruisers here, including the one with the mouth organ, are my bodyguard, Mr. Cohen. I'm pleased to meet you, Commander. How do you do? This is Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, glad to know you, Commander. How are things going? Hey, Cohen, can't, don't you ever get tired of playing that mouth organ? They stand away from the door. They want to close it. Will everyone please take your seats and fasten the seat belts? Are we ready to take off? Yes, in just a moment. Shepard. O'Reilly. Cohen. Come along to the front of the plane. Yes, sir. Oh, we'll sit in the back here, won't we, Fred? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, of course. I, um... Uh... Fred, is anything wrong? No. No, of course not. Why, Why what could be wrong? Then you'd better sit down. We're starting to move. That's good advice, Commander Onslow. But I must ask you, Miss Vale, not to touch the curtain on the window. Oh, how soon before we can open the curtain? As soon as we're well away from New York. You see that illuminated sign, no smoking, fasten seatbelt? Yes. What about it? When the lights and the sign go out, you can open the curtain and smoke as much as you like. Now, if you'll excuse me, certainly. You needn't try to fool me, Fred Onslow. I saw you. You saw what? I saw you pick up that scrap of paper one of those men dropped. Why, why that wasn't anything, Monica. May I see the paper? No. Why not? Well, because, uh, because I'd, I'd rather you didn't see it, that's all. There is something wrong, isn't there? Look, Monica, let me repeat over and over. What could be wrong? Why, there's Silas Naylor, an internationally famous figure, with a group of trusted attendants. Here's an ACA plane as safe and dependable as the old gray mare. All the same, All I... the same what? I wish I hadn't brought you along. I wish there was some kind of an emergency cord, like a train, so that you could stop this plane whenever you minutes. The great silver plane throbs against dead quiet. It's warm and stuffy in the cabin despite the hissing ventilator. Dim white reading lamps shine down on a double row of cushioned chairs along one side and a single row of cushioned chairs along the other. Ahead above the closed door to the pilot's control cabin, the red glowing sign still warns against opening those curtains. Aft in the plane sits Commander Onslow, his eyes fixed on the clock under that illuminated sign. Monica. Yes? What? It's not exactly all right. Fred, why do you say that? Because we should have been in Philadelphia five minutes ago. At least we should have been circling over the field. And we're not? No. Well, we're still 10 or 12,000 feet up if the pressure on my eardrums count for anything. And traveling like a bat out of Hades. Weather's delaying us, I guess, huh? Maybe it is. It's awfully bumpy, isn't it? Yes, a little. Makes you gasp for breath and your stomach turns. <laughs> a bad one. Not getting airsick, are you? I don't think so. I wish I had some of that chewing gum they give you. A ring for the air hostess. She'll bring you some. I did ring the bell, Fred, and there's no answer. Oh, she's busy in the pantry back there, that's all. 
She didn't hear you. Here, I'll get you some gum. No, no, wait, I'll, I'll go. Sure you're all right? I want a powder my nose anyway. Besides, you're going to have company. Uh, Mr. Shepard is weaving along this aisle as though he didn't like air pockets either. Well, thank the Lord one of that party's awake up there. I thought they were all dead. Don't say that. Say what? Dead. A spooky plane with everything so quiet and, and dead itself. Remember how the pilot walked through a while ago and looked around and walked, walked right back to the control cabin again? No, I didn't notice him. Oh, that's what I mean. It was like a ghost. <sighs> I'll be right back. I say, Commander Onslow. Yes, Mr. Shepard? Uh, mind if I sit down? Not at all. Go ahead. Fact is, Commander, I want to apologize. Oh, that's all right. Forget it. I'm not such an ill-mannered guy as I must have sounded. It's no joke, you know, taking care of the chief. I've got to go ahead like a cyclone, so, so that everything would be quiet when he gets there. And it's a great responsibility, too. I can imagine. I go on these long trips. There's the chief, half asleep, and... O'Reilly reading detective magazines and coin with his mouth organ. Doesn't that mouth organ bother the old boy? No, he likes it. Especially when coin plays the old square dances. Chief's a great man in his way. I was just wondering about that. Wondering what? Is it true? Stop me if I'm talking out of turn. Go ahead. We can trust the Navy. Is it true he's offered to design and build at his own expense a fleet of underwater cargo boats, uh, submersible freighters? Up to five or 6,000 tons? That it do away with the submarine menace altogether? Where did you hear that? Oh, just a rumor. Is it uh, true? Uh, yes, it's true enough. You see, Mr. Shepard, I'm one of the few people who believe that that plan is practical. But there must be a lot of people who would like to see Mr. Naylor put out of the way. There are, Commander. Only they can't get at him. You're quite sure of that? Dead sure. Hitler himself isn't better guarded. Why, you could no more shoot or stab or poison the chief than you could... Why, what was that? What happened? Monica? Is anything wrong back there? Well, it's, it's all right, sir. It's only a noise in the pantry. We'll see to it. Monica! Monica, pull yourself together. What's wrong? It's, it's that air hostess, Miss Lee. Well, what about her? She's lying back in the pantry among the broken dishes with her head all over blood. Somebody beat her over the head and left her there to die. Somebody? Yes. But well, nobody's gone back to the pantry. Nobody's gone past us except... Except the pilot, a co-pilot of this plane, remember? Excuse me, Mr. Shepard. I'm going to open the curtains on that window. Do you think it's wise, Commander? We were told not to. Well, we were told a lot of things. I'll just take the responsibility of... Good Lord! <gasps> there, there, Monica. Mr. Naylor, Mr. Naylor! Yes, son? What's up? Draw the curtain on your window and take a look down. If O'Reilly and Cohen have got guns, they better keep them handy. Is that so now? Why? Because we're not flying west. We're over the Atlantic Ocean now and headed straight out to sea. miles and miles away from land. We are miles away from land. Does anybody here know anything about first aid? I do, Commander. I studied medicine in the old days. Then you better go back and look after the hostess. We'll join Mr. Naylor. Steady, Mike. Well, I'm all right. It's this horrible blind feeling, that's it. Air pocket, look out. See here, Commander. What, we're over the ocean. What the devil's going on here, eh? You're being kidnapped, Mr. Naylor. That's my guess. Kidnapped, did you say? Ah, come off it, Commander. We ain't as dumb as that. The pilot and the co-pilot of this plane are fakes. They've replaced the real officers. Oh. On a dark day like this, with their raincoat collars turned up, they could have gotten away with it. And hijacked us straight off the airfield. Is that it? Yes, I'm afraid so. The hostess must have spotted one of them and knocked her out. Now, mm -hmm. what about the Air Force? Wouldn't they know a plane was missing? Well, not until we failed to show up at Philadelphia. The pilot would report by aerial radio telephone about oh, 15 minutes out of New York. But after that, silence. Excuse me, Commander. You say these two fake pilots are still aboard in that compartment there with the closed door? Yes, that's right. Well, what are we waiting for, Corn? Do we get to work on them? You said it, Barney. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, both of you. You wouldn't be trying to stop us, would you, Commander? The one thing we don't want is a gunfight 12,000 feet up. Can any of you fly a plane? No, not one of us. Now, neither can I. So if anything happens to those two pilots, how are we going to get down? I see, young fellow. Well, what are you going to do? 
First of all, we'll try rapping on the door. Have your gun ready. Yeah, you can count on that, sir. Fred, Fred, listen to me. Be quiet, Monica. Has, has this anything to do with the scrap of paper you picked up off the floor? What scrap of paper? Oh, never, of... never mind, sir. Why, this door, it's unlocked. Unlocked? Now, don't take any fool chances, young fellow. The way I always did when I was your age. Stand to one side when you open that door. Let Cohen and O'Reilly take care of it. Good Lord. Well, the control cabin is empty. There's nobody at the controls. You mean we're... We're flying without a pilot? Yes. See that stick move back and forth? As though a ghost had hold of it? Those crooks do. They set the automatic controls. It's a gyroscope attachment that keeps her steady. And then they must have bailed out. And what's going to happen to us? You see, Monica, the fact is... Go on, Fred. Tell me the truth. I'll know if you don't. Well, we'll go on until our gas runs out or until a storm hits us. Then we'll dive into the sea. It's as good a way of killing Mr. Naylor as any. I see, son. Have we got any chance at all? Frankly, I don't know. Wait till I get a look inside of that control cabin. Holy mother, that stuff. Cohen, stop it. Stop it! Yeah, Mr. Naylor? Stop playing that infernal mouth organ. Or if you must play it, play something cheerful. Yes, yeah, sure, Mr. Naylor, sure. How long do you think it'll be before we... Quiet, Cohen. Here's the commander back again. Well, young fellow... Radio telephone's out of order. We can't signal. Fred, what about those patrol ships? You said they're 200 miles out to watch for unidentified aircraft. Won't they see us? They've seen us already, I expect. They'll send for an army fighter plane to investigate, but... Well, what can it do? Yeah. Shoot us down, maybe, huh? That's fine. If only somebody could fly the plane. Well, nobody can, Skipper, so think of something else. See, Mr. Naylor, I was wrong. Wrong, son? About what? One of your party, and I can guess which one, dropped a torn piece of paper. There was a line of writing on it, probably the end of some instructions. Well? Those instructions ended, you should land just as your fuel fails at 7 o'clock a.m. You should land just as your fuel fails at 7 o'clock a.m. But, but that might not have anything to do with the sun. What made you suspicious of it? Because it was written in German. In German? Quiet, Colin. I can't hear myself think. Okay, okay, Mr. Naylor. I'm sorry. I thought the fake pilots were kidnapping you, maybe abroad. There's not enough fuel for that, is there? Well, if there's enough fuel for Los Angeles, then there's enough for Europe. Well, that won't work. They bailed out and left us to crash. Uh, excuse me, sir. But it's getting black as pitch out there. I think there's a storm coming up. What happens when that hits us? Plenty, O'Reilly. Plenty. Yeah, well, I was afraid of that. If only somebody could fly this plane, I could navigate it. Navigate it? Yes. You have to learn aerial navigation in my business. With enough figuring, I might even set a new course and try the automatic controls on it. No, I, I don't dare handle the ship. Wait a minute. I know a way out of this. Well, then speak up, miss. Is a 90-mile wind going to hit us any minute? The air hostess, of course. Miss Lee, what about her? I remember reading somewhere that most air hostesses get flying instructions when they've been with a company for a, well, a given length of time. You know, Miss Dale, that's true. There was a girl of Inter Airways who told me the same thing. And if this one can even make a try at landing a plane, we may get back to New York yet. I thought you said she'd been knocked out. Well, she is and badly hurt, but there's just a chance that maybe she's... There's Shepard, coming back from the pantry. Anybody got a drink? It wasn't very pleasant back there. How is she? You know, we were just wondering whether Miss Lee might be in any shape to pilot the plane. Pilot the plane? Why in blazes should she pilot the plane? There's no time to explain now, Shepard. But we're bound for Davy Jones unless something's done. Could she do it? No. Not even if we, uh, revived her? Not if all the doctors on Earth stood at her side. Why, but I... I don't think you understand, sir. Miss Lee has just died. Thin singing of wind above the clouds, then storm with a white eye of lightning at the windows, 
losing height, gaining it again, blown off her blind course, flung partway back again, always racing forward on a flight to nowhere. Late afternoon, evening, night, the steady throbbing of motors like a pulse beat inside the head. Towards morning, the storm dies away. In that dim cabin, there is exhaustion of nerves. The hands of the clock stand at a quarter of two in the morning. Monica. Monica. Wake up. Oh, oh, oh. Shh, shh, shh. It's Fred. Now keep your voice down. Have I been asleep? Yes, for a couple of hours. They say condemned criminals sleep on the night before their execution. Where are the others? I was a boy back home, the county down. My father used to say to me, Well, Neil Riley, says he, did you ever see a banshee? A banshee, says he, is the old woman that lets you know when you're going to die. Pipe down, you two. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Neil. Uh, no, uh, no offense, Chief. Can the man play a quiet game of solitaire without somebody yapping all the time? Nine on red dead. Listen, Monica, and listen carefully. My first idea was right after all. What are you talking about? There's somebody aboard this ship who can fly a plane. What? Shh. There is. I proved it by the automatic controls. Proved it how? If those controls had stayed as they originally were, the side winds would have blown us clear off our course. But we're still on our course. That shows that somebody's been sneaking in there and setting us right again when we do stray. Then you mean... I mean that we're headed for somewhere. We're being taken somewhere. But we may outwit this gentleman yet. Outwit who? Is somebody still talking back there? I'm sorry, Mr. Naylor. Monica's just waked up. None of us can feel very much like sleeping anyway. You're right, son. I admit it. Come up here and join me, will you? With pleasure. Twice in this card game, but I still can't make it come out. Oh, what's the use pretending anyway? We know we're in for it. It's this <laughs> waiting that gets you. Yeah, yeah, that goes for all of us, Mister Naylor. What I'm dreading is, is the minute when those motors choke and go dead, and we start whirling down, down, down. What does it sound like, Commander, when? When motors conk out? I've never heard it, Mr. Naylor, but I imagine it sounds like... Listen. I imagine it sounds like that. We're losing height. I can feel it. Well, Corn, I guess this is the payoff. Yeah, you said it. But look here, Mr. Naylor, we can't be out of fuel. Because it's too early. Look at the clock. It's only five minutes to two o'clock. I beg your pardon, old man. It's five minutes to seven o'clock. Seven o'clock? Are you crazy? No. Haven't you forgotten the cross-ocean changes in time? By George, the commander's right. European time is five hours ahead of our time. If you don't believe me, just notice that it's getting daylight outside. I was thinking of that message. You should land just as your fuel fails at 7 o'clock a.m. Stand perfectly still, all of you. Here, what's got into little Lord hey. Fauntleroy? I'll show you what's got into me, my friend. Yes, I rather thought you would. I shall go into that control cabin. Follow me if you like. I shall sit down at the controls, and I shall bring this plane safely to the ground. Safely to the ground? Where? In Germany, of course. Germany? Don't pull a gun, Cohen. If you plug him, we're all done for. That is good advice, Mr. Cohen. I might add that we're getting closer to the ground every minute. Ah, uh, for the love of... Do I take control? Yes, go ahead. But, uh, we're following you. Follow by all means. All right. Let's get comfortable here. I take up my position, so... There's fog below. Can you see? Well enough, Miss Dale. Well enough. We must go down rather quickly. And I can't help if it's somewhat rough on your ears. You young swine, what's the idea? The idea, dear patron, is to bring you and your plans for a submarine freighter to a country which will appreciate them. Then those two fake pilots... They were colleagues of mine. Unfortunately, if they had remained, your pug uglies would have started a gunfight. And none of us might have got here. Well? So they left by parachute. And I brought you safely, without blood or toil, into the boundaries of the Third Reich. You're going down too fast, man. Now take it easy. I am perfectly in command, thank you. Look out! Have... The trees, out, they're coming man. straight up at us! Oh, 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 oh. Oh. 
Are you all right, Monica? Are you all right? Yes. Oh, only a bit shaken up. We're all okay here, Skipper. Shall I give this guy the works now before they come to get us? No, don't shoot. Let him alone. That also is good advice. And now, my friends, my mission is ended. I stand up on the pilot's chair. I throw open this glass hatch. And to all Germany, to all the world, I cry. This is das gestohlene Flugzeug im Begriff zu landen auf Feld Nummer 21. Heil Hitler. Well, strike me blind if it ain't another one. Yes, first Rudolf S. and now this bloke. What do you suppose they want over here? English. Why are you speaking English? Why, Cocky? It's an even habit we've got in this country. This isn't England. Oh, yes, it is. Better climb out of here and with your hands up. But it can't be. I followed the course laid down on those instruments. Unfortunately, old man, I altered our course last night. Keep back, Shepard, or you may get a bullet in the head yet. Your instructions were all right, but they didn't tell you about the five hours difference in time. When we got to the right navigation point, I let the fuel out of the tanks and made you think we were landing in Germany. <laughs> you know, there's nothing like having a good Nazi for a taxi driver, is there? <laughs> So ends Death Flies Blind, starring Richard Dix with Gail Page and Montague Love. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, same time, when Mr. Paul Lucas will star in the suspense play called Mr. Markham, Antique Dealer. Ladies and gentlemen, on the following Tuesday, May 18th, Mr. Charles Lawton and Miss Elsa Lanchester will be with us in one of the most famous of Agatha Christie's thrillers, The ABC Murders. William Spear, the producer, Ted Bliss, director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Mahowick, the conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In our starring Hollywood cast this evening is Mr. Peter Lorre, who appears as a mysterious gentleman called George Ravel. Miss Wendy Berry plays our worried heroine, Marjorie. Mr. George Zuko is the lawyer, Alex Stevens. The story called The Moment of Darkness is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold a solution until the last possible moment. And so, with a moment of darkness and with the performances of Peter Lorre, Wendy Berry, George Zuko and our other players, we again hope to keep you in Suspense. The Train Bleu crack express train from Paris to the French Riviera, which in these carefree days before the war, used to make the journey from Paris to Nice overnight. At the Gare du Sud on this particular mild spring evening, the train with its glistening wagon lees or sleeping cars 
waits in a station filled with smoke and the iron coughing of engines. You can hear the excited crowd at the slamming of compartment doors. You can see the guard standing by with his watch in hand, with his horn ready to blow the signal. En voiture, messieurs les voyageurs! En voiture! Oui, à bientôt! You better get in, Emily. The train's just about ready to start. Commotion there. The last moment just before the signal, a girl in a light summer dress carrying a small suitcase hurries along the platform towards car number 10. The girl is blonde and evidently English, and as she hurries towards the guard... En voiture! Dépêchez-vous, mesdemoiselles. Hurry up, please. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Is this carriage number 10? Oui, mademoiselle, numéro 10. Hurry up, please. Thank you. I'll get in. Et at least a mile long. Car 10. Compartment number 6. Compartment number 6. Compartment... Uh, oh, here it is. Yes, come in. Mr. Stevens, I... Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. That's quite all right. Won't you come in? I, uh, I thought this was Mr. Stevens' compartment. It is his compartment. I'm sharing it with him. He, uh... He is on the train, isn't he? Oh, yes, yes. He's going to look for some luggage that failed to turn up. In the meantime, won't you come in and sit down? Thank you. As an old friend of Toby Stevens, why do you smile? <laughs> Nothing. It's just odd to hear a dignified man like Mr. Stevens called Toby. That's all. Well, it suits him. As an old friend of his anyway, may I introduce myself? I'm Ken Blake, on vacation from the American consulate in London. How do you do? My name is Gray, Marjorie Gray. I, uh, I most particularly wanted to have a word with Mr. Stevens. Miss Gray, will you pardon my impertinence if I ask... Ask what? Whether it's about your Aunt Hester at Monte Carlo and the man who seems so determined to scare her to death. You know about that? Yes, a little. After all, that's why Toby's left his law practice and come all the way from London. He said... Mr. Stevens. Marjorie. Great Scott, what are you doing here? I came up from Monte Carlo especially to see you. I thought I'd find you in Paris, but when I got to your hotel, they told me you'd gone. Cook said they'd reserved a compartment on this train for you. So, well, here I am. But why? Before you see Aunt Hester, Mr. Stevens, I want to know what you meant by that letter you wrote to me. I meant exactly what I said, Marjorie. I'm going to expose this faker, George Revel. <laughs> Excuse me, if you two want to talk, I'll just clear out of here. Oh, no, Ken, stay where you are. Really, Mr. Stevens? You made an impression on her, Ken. When a girl suddenly becomes thoroughly British after spending half her life on the Riviera, well, you made an impression. Don't talk like that, Toby. She won't get annoyed with you for saying it. She'll just get annoyed with me. Marjorie, this is Ken Blake. We've met. Thanks. I asked him to come along with me, and for a very good reason. Indeed? Ken was for years at the American consulate in Paris. He knows all the heads of the Surete General. That's the Scotland Yard of France. And in particular, he knows the great detective Flamand, who's the chef de Surete. I thought Kent might be very useful when we nab Ravel. But I tell you, Ravel is dangerous. Dangerous, my eye. Something's going to happen. I know something dreadful's going to happen. Now, let's face the situation, Marjorie. Your Aunt Hester is middle-aged, wealthy, and... Uh... Oh, if only Uncle Paul hadn't died. He was the decentest person I ever knew. But he did die, my dear. And Hester can't be consoled. She can't eat, she can't sleep, she can't think of anything except getting in touch with his spirit. Along comes this faker Ravel to give seances. I wonder if he is a faker. You're not falling for this Tommy Rot, surely. Really, Mr. Blake? If I'd asked for your advice in this matter... I beg your pardon, Miss Gray. When we get to Nice, I'll take the first train back to Paris. Oh, no. No, wait, please. I, I didn't mean to be rude. It's nice of you to help us, but it's the whole atmosphere of Monte Carlo. Well, that's quite all right, my dear. We understand, of course. There's Aunt Hester in that villa over the Mediterranean. There's Ravel, all thin and quiet and swarthy, with those somber-looking eyes of his. He, he seems to dominate her, just as Mr. Stevens used to. Dominate her, my dear? That's rather a strong word for an easygoing old buffer like me. Oh, the things Ravel does at those seances are terrifying. I don't know whether he's an imposter or not, but I am sure nobody else can do what he does. Now, there, Marjorie, is where you're wrong. I can. You can? Yes, I promise to duplicate in front of your aunt every single trick Ravel ever performed. Oh, but that's impossible. Is it? Wait and see. I'll put it up to Mr. Blake. 
It isn't merely that Ravel is tied up, tied hand and foot in a chair, while these horrible things are going on. I know there are people who can get out of ropes and back into them again. But Ravel lets you take one precaution that shows there can't be any trickery. Oh, and what is that precaution? Just before the lights go out, he takes a piece of white paper. Well? He puts one under each foot. You take a pencil and draw an outline around the shoe on the paper. If he moved the millionth fraction of an inch, it would show in the outline later. But it never does. <laughs> well, look here, Toby, that's a bad one. Why does it strike you as being so funny? Because I can do it, too. Just give me a moment of darkness, that's all. You mean he gets out of his shoes or something like that? No, he could hardly get out of his shoes and back into them without disturbing the outline. Then he doesn't leave his chair after all. On the contrary, he can be all over the room. Well, how in Satan's name does he do it? My dear fellow, there's nothing simple. The Villa Bijou Monte Carlo the next evening. On the lighted terrace, that white villa overlooking the olive groves and the sea, three people are seated at their ease enjoying the night air. Below glitters the town, a white palm garden. But even its lamps are dimmed by the firework illuminations from the Promenade des Anglais. When the Principality of Monaco celebrates its ruler's birthday, Great rockets go hissing upwards to burst and bloom in colored fires against a black sky. Yes, I don't like those fireworks. The noise upsets me. I wish they'd stop. Never mind the fireworks, Hester. You've heard my proposition. Give me an answer. Oh, what's more? You spill broth on your jacket at dinner. You're the clumsiest eater I ever saw. Here, here. Let me take a handkerchief to it. Please, Aunt Hester. Won't you answer, Mr. Stevens? Why don't you two let me alone, both of you? We're only trying to help you. Don't you believe that? Oh, yes, I, 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 I believe it. But I'm happy. I talked with my husband twice last week. Now, look here, Hester. This has got to stop. Why? Ravel's a fraud, and I can prove it. If Monsieur Ravel is a fraud, what is he gained by this? Has he not asked for money? I don't know. Has he? No. Not a penny. You haven't changed your will by any chance. People do queer things sometimes that even their solicitors don't know about. Oh, no, dear, I haven't changed my will. When I die, uh, Marjorie inherits everything. I am a lonely woman. I'm getting old. I haven't got much to look forward to. Now, why don't you go your way and let me go mine? Suppose Ravel is a fraud. Just suppose it. Well, all right, have your way. You wouldn't like to think you'd been deliberately tricked and imposed on now, would you? Oh, well, no, no, of now, course Now, listen, Hester. If I prove to you these so-called miracles were really tricks that I can do myself. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Alex, Alex Stevens. I offer to prove that here and now. Would that shake your faith a little? Mm, yes, I, I suppose it would. I. But how did you become so clever all of a sudden? How did you become so gullible all of a sudden? You used to scoff at this sort of thing. You used to be gay and lively and go to the casino. Well, that was before Paul died. You're shivering, Marjorie. If you feel cold, put on a wrap. I'm, I'm not cold. It's... It's only... Only what? Oh, I've got a kind of presentiment that there's something dreadful hanging over us. I can't tell what direction it's taking or who's in danger. But I'm sure it's going to burst. Just as sure as I... My George, look at that rocket. Yes. Red and gold stars. And a deathly white blaze like the life we're living. You can see every leaf in the garden. Every blade of grass. And we can also see... Look there. Ravel and Ken Blake coming up the path. This, this Ken Blake, Mr. Stevens... Are you sure he's quite honest? My dear Marjorie, Ken's all right. I've known him for years. I thought he came here to help expose Ravel. But he and Ravel are as thick as thieves. What sort of game is going on here? Game, mademoiselle? You spoke of a game? Yes, Monsieur Ravel, I did. So did I, friend Ravel. Are you ready for my demonstration tonight? Demonstration? In the seance room upstairs. You claim you can bring back the dead. Pardon me, monsieur. I claim nothing. When I'm in trance, I cannot tell what happens. But I can. I'm going to make ghosts walk by perfectly natural means. You know, Monsieur Stevens, I, I don't understand your logic. Logic? Yes, you wish to, uh, how do you put it? Expose me? But how will you expose me by these childish tricks? If I show you a counterfeit ten-pound note, 
Does that prove there's no Bank of England? I'm not going to argue subtleties with you. You can always beat me there. <laughs> I'm a plain, ordinary man with a little common sense to back me up. No, no, no. Come on, my friend. Not an ordinary man, surely. Just exactly what are you hinting at? Yes, I... I I'd like to know that, too. Oh, Madame Hester, believe me. I didn't mean to upset you. I, it would, I, I wouldn't upset you for anything. No, I'll bet you wouldn't. Well, I kiss your hand, Madame. I'm, I'm all apologies. Well... Let this gentleman do what he likes. But I warn him, it is dangerous. Dangerous? How is it dangerous? That's the first time you've spoken, Mr. Blake. Why have you been so quiet? Uh, please, Marjorie, please now, be a good girl and stop interrupting. Oh, I'm sorry, Aunt Hester, but he's been muttering to himself and moving from one foot to the other and, and looking guilty. Confounded, I'm not looking guilty. Aren't you? No, it's a hot night. I don't like this business at all. Why will a seance be dangerous? Why? Because we shall be tampering with evil forces. Evil forces, my foot. Oh, you doubt it? Yes. <laughs> this brave Monsieur Stevens is challenging the unseen world. He's mocking at forces he does not understand. Believe me, Monsieur, they are not mocked without danger. I'll risk that, thanks. Well, up in a seance room, with a door bolted on the inside, we shall be at their mercy. The evil forces, the elementals will wax and grow strong. They can take us in their grip as I take this walking stick and... You've got strong hands, Monsieur Ravel. The hands of evil spirits are stronger. Much stronger. I'm afraid. I wonder if we ought to do this. I've been wondering the same thing. What does your aunt say? Oh, I, I, I don't know what to say. I, I'm so confused. And I want to break down and cry. I... Well, I suppose we'd better do it, or Alex Stevens will never let me hear the end of it. For the last time, monsieur, will you be warned of danger? No. Very well. Oh, Madame Hester. Uh, yes, monsieur, for then. Do you believe that I'm an imposter? No. No, it is, of course not, but... Uh, but in uh, your heart, you're not yet convinced. Uh, well, I... I, I, don't, I don't know. I, well, you know, I'm not such a fool as some people seem to think. But if something did happen, something to show there are living forces beyond this world, it would convince you utterly? Oh, yes, I... I, I suppose it would. <laughs> then uh, shall we allow Monsieur Stevens to go on with his demonstration? I have a feeling we shouldn't do this. Oh, I'm afraid! Upstairs... At the Villa Bijou, there is a small, bare, deeply carpeted room. Its only furniture consists of a round table, five chairs, and a large cabinet phonograph. There is only one door, and there are no windows. In one chair, a little way back from the table, sits Mr. Alexander Stevens. He is tied hand and foot, the outline of his shoes drawn with pencil on pieces of paper, so that he cannot move. Now then, friend Raphael, have you quite finished tying me up? Yes, and I bet you you won't get out of these knots, sir. Well, we'll see about that. Are the rest of you ready? Yes, yes, all right. Oh, dear, I, I wish I'd put some smelling salts in my handbag. Well, what do you want us to do now? We'll have conditions exactly as they are for Mr. Ravel. I'll sit in this chair back from the table. You four sit around the table, clasping hands to form a circle. All right, let's get on with it. Ken, will you start the gramophone? <laughs> I believe it's customary, Mr. Ravel, to have hymns played at the beginning of the seance to establish the proper frame of mind. Yes, monsieur, that's true. You fool. What did you say? Oh, uh, nothing, monsieur. Please continue. Start the gramophone, Ken. When you've done that, turn out the lights on that switch by the door. Then join the circle. Clasp each other's hands tightly and don't let go unless... Unless what? Well, unless something gets me. Be careful, monsieur. Go on, please. Start the gramophone. All right, here goes. Now the lights, Ken. Switch off the lights. Lights? Yes, yes, yes. There you are. It's pitch dark. I can't see my way back to the table. Here, Ken. Here's my hand. Thank the you. Line on the on the other side, Mr. Blake. Thank you. I've got my bearings now. Are all of you clasping the hands of the next person? Then quiet and wait for what's going to happen.
Ken, look. Look where? Over there, where Mr. Stevens is sitting. What about it? There's a luminous spot in the dark, about the size of a shilling. It's... Shh, it's... shh, quiet, quiet, please. Did anything touch the back of your neck? No. Ah! Oh, 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 Break the circle and get those lights on. The luminous spot is still there. Oh, hurry, Ken. I can't see my way in the dark. I don't know which direction the lights are. Wait a minute. Here's the wall. If I grope along here, I ought to find the switch. Yes, yes, here it is. Lights. Ah! Quiet. Quiet silence, mademoiselle, if you please. What's wrong with Mr. Stevens? What's that sticking out of his chest? It's the handle of a dagger. And a good deal of blood has soaked through his coat, too. Oh, Monsieur Blake, will you turn off this gramophone? Yes, certainly. But you're not saying that Toby Stevens is dead. I'm afraid he is, my friend. That's a direct heart wound. Perhaps ten seconds of intense agony, and then the end. Oh, is the door still bolted from the inside? Yes. Then we are all alone, here, the four of us. This rash gentleman, one imagines, did not kill himself. He's too well tied up. I know who killed him. Mr. George Ravel. You did, with luminous paint. I killed him, mademoiselle? With luminous paint? I mean, that was part of the trick. You tied him up. You were the only one who touched him. And? What of that, mademoiselle? Luminous paint doesn't show up in the light. You smeared a little of it on his coat. <laughs> that showed you exactly where to strike in the dark. I commend your good sense, madame. But there are two excellent reasons why I had nothing to do with this. The first reason I, I must keep to myself, but the second reason can easily be proved. Well, what is it? Well, up to the time that man screamed, you yourself were holding my right hand, and Madame Hester was holding my left hand. Did either of you let go at any time? No. No, that is, that is I didn't. What about you, Aunt Hester? No, no, Marjorie did. I didn't let go either. He never moved. Hold on. Wait a minute. Well, monsieur, speak up. I was holding Marjorie's hand on one side and her aunt's on the other. And they didn't move either. Nobody let go or left the circle. That's true. Consequently, none of us could have killed Toby Stevens. Yes, it is true. Somebody must have sneaked in here. Oh, no. As you said yourself, the door is bolted on the inside. Then who the devil did kill him? Well, that's the question. Has anybody ever seen that dagger before? No. It, it looks like one of those curio things you buy in the shops. Yes, and uh, with the design of wooden scroll work on the handle. No fingerprints will show. Nothing else. Except some musical instruments. <laughs> a tambourine, an accordion, and a speaking trumpet. You know, I, I blame myself for this. You ought to. Why? Because you killed him. Don't ask me how, but I know why. Indeed, mademoiselle. You found my motive. Yes, yes, I have. You've got Aunt Hester fully believing in you now, haven't you? Easy, Marjorie. In another minute, you'll be talking about forces and elementals and heaven knows what. <laughs> you'll be saying it was a spirit hand that killed Mr. Stevens because nobody else could have. Please, Marjorie, brace up. Someone's got to send for the police. Why don't you send for the police, Ken? Couldn't you help us there? Help you? How? Mr. Stevens said you knew the heads of the Sûreté. He said you knew this man, Flamand, who's supposed to be the greatest detective in France. Oh, but this isn't French territory. Monte Carlo is the independent state of Monaco. I'm sorry, Marjorie. Ordinarily, I might have helped. You mean you won't help us? I'm sorry, Marjorie. I can't. Then I've got to help myself. George Ravel, you killed Mr. Stevens! But how? Yes, how? <laughs> Twenty-four hours later, twenty-four hours of blind puzzling. In the railway station at Nice, nine miles from Monte Carlo, the night express for Paris is already underway. The guard has blown his signal, and the great wheels grind. A young man, hatless and worried, pushes through the crowd past the already moving train. No, monsieur. C'est défendu. Vous êtes trop tard. Too late, nothing. I'm getting aboard this train. On est garde, monsieur. I'm sorry to have caused you any trouble, guard. But do you happen to know whether... Marjorie! Ken Blake! What are you doing on this train? Exactly the question I wanted to ask you. 
Walk along the corridor with me, will you? All right. Marjorie, you little idiot. What's the idea of running away? If it's any of your business, Mr. Blake, I'm not running away. I'm merely going to Paris. You were told to stay in Monte Carlo. Don't you know you can land in jail for this? They'll put you in jail too, won't they? Yes, I suppose so. But what's the idea of going to Paris? Well, first of all, I had to get Aunt Hester away from that man, Ravel. She really thinks he can call up ghosts now. Is your aunt on this train? Yes, in that compartment there. Second, I'm going to Paris for some real help. I'm going to the Surete. I'm going to see this man, Flamand. You won't find Flamand in Paris, Marjorie. And you'll certainly never get him to arrest Georges Ravel. Oh? And why not? Because, my dear idiot, Georges Ravel is Flamand. What are you saying? The man who calls himself Ravel is really Flamand, the head of the whole French detective bureau. He made me promise not to tell anybody. And that's why you've been looking so guilty for two days. Yes, I tried to tip you off today, but the police were with us all the time. So he is a fake spiritual medium. Mr. Stevens was right about that. And I still say I'm right about the other thing. Whoever he is, Ravel killed Mr. Stevens. But how and why? Oh, I don't know. This alleged detective. Did he tell you why he was masquerading as a medium in Monte Carlo? No. All I know is that we're in one sweet mess. We've left town without permission... They'll probably stop the train and send us back in a patrol wagon. Oh, no, 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 my friend. That won't be at all necessary. Ravel! Yes, mademoiselle. Ravel or uh, Flamand. <laughs> well, since you know me as Ravel, call me that. You, you knew that I was on this train? Oh, naturally. Look here, old man. I kept quiet about you because you swore it was a matter of life and death. But will you answer a couple of questions now? Oh, with pleasure. Why did you pose as a medium? Because the Monarchian government employed me to trap a murderer. So I had to work hard, you see, undercover. All right. Why was Toby Stevens killed? Stevens was killed because he was a blackmailer. A blackmailer? Yes, mademoiselle. Does that surprise you? Yes. Oh, yes, of course. Very much. I tried to warn Stevens, but the fool wouldn't listen. And then, well, I wasn't quick enough. Stevens was murdered, of course, by one of us four in the seance room. Well, that's impossible. Hmm? Impossible? Oh, no. The trick was baffling because of its simplicity. I'm sure you killed him. <laughs> one moment, mademoiselle. Let me show you what I mean by trick baffling because it is so simple. Take, for example, the pencil outline drawn on a paper around the medium shoes. Did Stevens tell you... How I did that? No. On this train two nights ago, he, he started to tell us, but... And then he just stopped in the middle of it and laughed. <laughs> you see, the medium leaves his chair. Well, he makes tambourines rattle and ghost forms appear. Yet the pencil outline is not disturbed. Now, how does he manage it? Well, how does he manage it? Well, quite easily. He returns to his chair... He turns over the two pieces of paper. He takes another pencil and draws an outline of his shoes on the reverse side of the paper. <laughs> you look at it. Uh... And imagine it's the same outline we drew. Precisely. So easily are people misled. And it was the same way with a murder. But there couldn't have been any trick about the murder. None of us left the circle. We were all clasping hands when we heard that scream. Don't you agree? Hmm? Oh, yes, I agree. I can't stand this any longer. When we heard Mr. Stevens utter that horrible scream... What I... makes you think it was Stevens who uttered that scream? I... I beg your pardon. What makes you think it was Stevens who screamed? Well, wasn't it? Oh, you assumed it, yes. We, we all assumed it. But up to that time, Stevens wasn't even hurt. Wasn't hurt? You see, the source of sound cannot be located in the dark. It was the murderer who uttered that appalling cry. In a few seconds of darkness, before the lights went on, the killer simply leaned across and drove that dagger into Stevens' chest. And you proved that? Yes. If Stevens had been hit at the time of the scream, blood would have blotted out the spot of luminous paint. Yet... Marjorie Gray saw the pain shining after the scream. That's true, Marjorie. I heard you say so. You put the luminous paint there, Ravel. You were the only person who touched him. Oh, no. 
There was one other person who touched him. Who was it? Another person in full sight of you said Stevens had spilled broth on his coat and swabbed at his chest with a handkerchief. You mean... I mean, of course, the real murderer. You are Aunt Hester. Yes, Marjorie. Your Aunt Hester. Aunt Hester. Keep back, all of you. Oh, so you managed to find the revolver. Marjorie, I poisoned your Uncle Paul. I poisoned my husband. And Alex Stevens knew it. You can't get away, madame. <laughs> Keep away from that door. I never believed in spiritualism. I let myself be influenced by a medium because Alex Stevens would try to stop it. He was getting money out of me. He wanted no other influence. Don't open that door, madame. But I am opening it. Oh, Aunt Hester, don't! I told you I wasn't a fool as I looked. I had the knife in my hand. Stop her, can't stop her! Ah! Well, mademoiselle, <laughs> she has committed many crimes, but now she has paid for them all. <laughs> And so closes The Moment of Darkness, starring Peter Laurie, Wendy Berry, with George Zuko. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Agnes Moorhead and Ray Collins will star in a study in terror titled The Diary of Sophronia Winter. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Wilbur Hatch, Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our distinguished star this evening is the stage and screen favorite, Mr. Paul Lucas, whose performance is in The Lady Vanishes, and in the stage production, The Watch on the Rhine, you will recall with pleasure. Tonight's tale of suspense is a story by John Dixon Carr, Fire, Burn, and Cauldron Bubble. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights... You will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with Fire Burn and Cauldron Bubble and the performance of Paul Lucas and the other members of our company, we again hope to keep you in... Drury Lane Theater presents the distinguished American actor Myron Willard in Shakespeare's Macbeth with magic effects especially designed by Ludwig von Arnheim.
historic Drury Lane Theatre, a relic of old London. On this site, in the cramped and crooked lanes of Aldwych, there has been a playhouse since Nell Gwynne sold oranges in the pit. The present theatre, though modernized, is heavy and darkened with time. By daylight, it is a dinginess of red plush seats, haunted by old ghosts. But at night, when the lights bloom for some new production, when the murmur of a crowd fills the carpeted aisles and the orchestra begins to tune up, it is kindled with that strange magic before the rise of the curtain. Oh, it's this way, sir. E12 and 13. Program. Pocket. Thank you. No, Madam, this is Rowie, your seat for G4. And backstage, where nerves crawl and there is a tendency to scream, the three witches of the play are huddled around the peephole in the curtain, looking out into the audience. They are hideous-looking creatures, these witches, in gray rags like cobwebs. But as they speak... Dear, I am scared. Don't let it bother you, darling. You can't even see the audience when the floats are on. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing except the size of the take at the box office. You won't even have to worry about that tonight. Look out there. You two are shaking as much as I am. Now, don't pretend. All right, all right. Everybody's jumpy on first night. What I can't understand is why they want to use young girls as witches. And then make us talk in cracked voices as though we were 80. Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. Oh, oh, what's that? Katie, hey, darling, it's only one of the ghost effects. You've been hearing it for weeks at rehearsals. I will say this for Marin Willard, as an actor and a manager, too. He's the first one who's ever had a real professional magician to do the ghost effects for this ham show. Oh, are they Celia? Look there. Where? Out in the audience in the second puffer box on the left-hand side. Oh. Don't you see the woman who's just coming in? Yes, I can see her. Not a bad-looking bit of goods for her age. What about her? But that's Marcia Blair. Marcia Blair? You don't mean you've never heard of her. I can't say I have either if it comes to that. Move over, Ivy. Give us a squint. Marcia Blair used to be Mr. Willard's leading lady. She was a very great actress 15 years ago. Oh, 15 years ago. She's had a terribly romantic history. Well, she's made lots of money and retired from the stage. Then she married some horrible no good, and... Did you see that tall, gray-haired man standing beside her? Well, he doesn't look much like a no good. That's not the man I mean, Celia. That's Howard White, her second husband. Oh. They say he loved her for years and followed her about and practically worshipped her. But she was married to this no good and wouldn't get a divorce. Then the no good died, I suppose. So Marcia Blair and her faithful Howard got married. Yes. I remember reading in the paper that they've been married one year tonight. I I expect they're very happy. Well, I'd be happy, too, if I had a mink coat and a string of pearls like that. Well, you've got to admit she's beautiful. All right, Katie, if you say so. I used to go and see her act when I was a little girl. She she was kind of an idol. I wonder what they're saying to each other up in that box now. I wonder what they're saying. Martha, dear, I wish you wouldn't be so uneasy. Nothing can happen to you here. You're uneasy yourself, Howard. Yes, I suppose I am a little. Howard, I know I shouldn't be talking like this on our first anniversary. But that's what worries me. What if Barry isn't dead? What if he isn't dead? Oh, listen to me, darling. Your late husband, heaven condemn his soul, died in New York more than a year ago. We have proof of that. Well, then who wrote those letters to me? I don't know, dear. Somebody playing a joke on you. Joke? If you marry him, Marsha, you won't be alive a year from then. Joke. But you're married to me, my dear, and you are alive. Shall I quote you something from another play, Howard? Well? The Ides of March are come. I, Caesar, but not gone. And it's still two hours. Two hours to the time we were actually married. Oh, look here, dear. This is carrying an obsession too far. It would be just like Barry to wait until the last moment, just to make it worse. You knew him. Yes, I knew him. He was a genius. I suppose so. As a mere businessman, I never quite understood this theatrical temperament, huh? except yours, of course. Barry was a greater actor than Myron Mullet will ever be. Barry could play anything... From a cockney to King Lear. His skill at makeup wasn't merely good, 
It was terrifying. Oh, Howard, I am frightened. Suppose he's managed to get close to us tonight and, and yet we can't see him. Well, the music started, Marcia. I, I shall have to go. Must you go, Howard? Really? If I break this appointment with Ferndale, dear, the deal will be called off. And since I haven't got too much backing anyway, I... All right, dear. I understand. Go ahead. Unless you wanted to come with me. And Miss Myron's opening tonight? Oh, I couldn't do that. I tell you, you'll be perfectly safe here, dear. Of course, Howard. I know that. You're in full view of 3,000 people. Nobody could attack you. The only door to this box is guarded. Outside that door will be Miss Fenton, who's devoted to you. And the chauffeur, who's even more devoted to you. What could happen, dear? Nothing, of course. And I'd prefer to be alone anyway. Yes, I rather guess oh, that. Oh, please, dear. It's just that I can't endure anybody being with me when I'm watching a great play. But that doesn't include you, darling. Then, if you'll accept these, madam, in honor of our first anniversary... Oh, Howard! Well, they're lovely. Of course I'll accept them. And here's a program. Got everything else you need? Yes. Yes, I think so. I just opened the door to the passage to make sure our watchdogs are on guard. Yes, they're out there, all right. Good night, Master. See you in an hour or two. Good night, Howard. And good luck. Miss Fenton, Bradley? Yes, Mr. White. Yes, sir, anything wrong? Miss Fenton, you've been my wife's companion secretary for five or six years. Yes, Mr. White, and I've loved every minute of it. And you, Bradley, you haven't been my chauffeur for quite so long, but they tell me you're an ex-wrestler. That's right, sir. Champion of the Shoreditch Athletic Club. And in my prime, though I says it shouldn't, as good a man as ever climbed through the ropes. Now, you know your instructions, Bradley. You trust me, sir. Nobody gets into this here box tonight unless it's over my dead body. Nothing must happen, do you understand? Nothing. Please, you're as white as paper. As for you, Miss Fenton, I'm afraid it's a little awkward. I know I ought to ask you to go in and join Marcia, but... Oh, you needn't apologize, Mr. White. I know she doesn't want company. She'll be leaning forward with her elbows on the box rail, just as she always does. She isn't merely watching a play. She's acting, Lady Macbeth. Every line, every gesture... Oh, and I don't mean to disturb her. You you won't leave this door, either of you. You trust me, sir. If... Oh, no. Well, anything wrong, Bradley? It is a very rummy-looking cove coming along the passage, sir, wearing a big black cloak with a red lining. Oh, that man, Bradley, that's only Herr von Arnheim. He's a professional magician and escape artist. I was just wondering... Excuse me. Don't worry, Mr. White. We'll look after her. Von Arnheim. I say von Arnheim. Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake the gory locks at me. I <laughs> beg your pardon. And I beg yours, my friend. I was merely quoting a line from the play. You are not leaving the theater. Surely not walking out on Macbeth. I'm afraid I have got to. Oh, that's a pity, my friend. You will miss some of my best effects, to say nothing of Shakespeare's. <laughs> when Banquo's ghost appears at the table. I don't want to hear any more about ghosts, thanks. Banquo's or anybody else's. I imagine you mean your wife's late husband. You've heard about it then? Yes, your wife has told me a good deal. She seems to think that in my profession I might have some charm over demons or spell against ghosts. You know, Van Arnhem, in a muddled kind of way, that's what I've been wondering myself. No, unfortunately, no. I am all too human. But your problem interests me. And I confess it worries me. What is you? What about me? As I understand it... Her first husband was a half-mad American actor who later went completely mad and died in New York. His, uh... Oh, what's the word I want? Our obsession? Uh, that's it, obsession. His obsession was Marcia Blair's eyes. Yes, always her eyes. They seemed to hypnotize him. It is not new, you know. You'll find the same motive, the eyes of a beautiful woman, all through the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Then, as I understand it, after this man's death, she began to receive a series of letters. Foul letters. Apparently written by him and threatening her with some rather horrible form of death if she married you. I tell you, Barry Lake is dead. He can't get up out of his coffin. Oh, getting out of coffins, my friend, is not so difficult. I have done it myself. Oh, please stop joking, Van Arnheim. You don't happen to be dead. True. There is that small difference. Um, is your wife here in the theater tonight? Yes. She wouldn't have come here except that it's Marin Willard's first night. And we haven't seen Marin, either of us, in years. She's back there in box D. Mm, so I hear it. Uh, I was hoping uh, that you might invite me to share the box. Uh, look here, old man. I, 
I don't want to seem inhospitable, but uh, she doesn't want company. Well, that's about it. Well, then walk back a little distance with me, this way. So that you can see the stage from the back of the dress circle. Now, the orchestra has stopped and they'll ring up in a moment. There. Look at it. Look at what? The stage, man. The lights have gone out. All except the dim yellow footlights shining at the curtain. The last cough, the last murmur, the last rustle of program dies away in one vast breathing hush. The curtain goes up. Let go of my arm, Von Arnheim. I, I've got to leave. Now, what are the stage directions? A desert place. Thunder and lightning. Enter three witches. When, indeed, I wonder. May I beg your pardon, Von Arnheim? Do you no, speak? No, it was nothing. Papers for that year 1936. You may read how Myron Willard triumphed at Drury Lane as Macbeth. But tonight, as the clock ticks on, there is another drama in the dimly lighted corridor outside Box D. There sits Miss Louise Fenton, Marcia Blair's companion secretary. Beside her, burly and broken nosed, is Big Jim Bradley, the ex wrestler. And when more than half an hour has passed. There's the applause, Jim. That must be the end of the first act. Yes, I hear it. Nothing's happened. But take my word for it, nothing's going to happen. Oh, she's such a likable person, Jim. And I think one of our greatest Shakespearean actresses. Well, I don't much care for this Shakespeare business, miss. You give me a good movie with gangsters in it. It's my style. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. I've seen her as Juliet. As Rosalind, as Portia, in our own drawing room without any props. I've heard as Lady Macbeth, too. <laughs> you should see her eyes. Her uh, eyes, Miss? Yes, you should see her eyes when she delivers that speech. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal end. Hey, Miss, look there. Well, what is it? That foreign looking cove in the black cape coming along the passage now. Easy. I beg your pardon. You are Miss Louise Fenton, aren't you? Uh, yes, my name is Fenton. What is it? I am looking for Arnheim, a friend of Mr. White's. And I must see Marcia Blair at once. No, you don't, Governor. You're not going in there. Why not? Because nobody goes in there. Not if it was the king himself. That's orders. Now, listen to me, both of you. When the lights went on, I happened to be looking at Box D from the other side of the theater. And I think yes. there is something wrong. But there can't be anything wrong. Jim Bradley and I have been sitting here the whole time. Except, of course... Except when? Well, except when I went in there for a few seconds. You went in there, Miss Fenton? May I ask when that was? Well, it was after Mr. White had gone and just before the play started. I went in to ask if she wanted anything. She said she didn't, so I came out again. And Bradley's been with me all the time, except when he went to get a drink of water up the corridor. That's as true as gospel, Captain. One moment and listen to me. Marcia Blair is leaning forward across the railing of the box. Oh, but that's nothing, Herr von Arnheim. That's the way she always is. Does she always fall forward with her arms held straight out and her head down on her arms? You better be careful, miss. It's a trick. Trick? Why not open the door and see for yourselves? Would that do any harm? No, I... I suppose it wouldn't, but... Oh, there must be some mistake. We haven't heard a sound from in there... There couldn't be anything wrong. You open the door, Miss Fenton. I'm going to hold tight to this gentleman, just in case. <laughs> Quiet, please. Quiet. What is it, Miss? Oh. Walk in there with me, both of you. Please go casually, as though nothing were wrong. <clears throat> we don't want to attract attention. Now. Oh, help on, Arnheim. There's blood all over her face. Yes. 
And don't begin screaming again, Miss Fenton, when I tell you she's dead. Bradley? Uh, yes, sir? Pick Miss Blair's body up and carry her out into the corridor. In another minute, we'll have the whole theater wanting to know what's wrong. All right, sir. You win. But what about the people in the other boxes? Won't they see? They've gone down to the bar to get a drink. They won't see anything. Hurry. Uh, uh, she ain't no lightweight, the poor lady ain't. Uh, steady does it. Uh, hold the door open. That's got it. Now, close the door. Shall I... Put her down on the floor, Gaffney? Yes, better do that. I never took those threats seriously. That's what I blame myself for. And if something did happen, well, I, I thought he'd attack her. I never thought he'd hide away across the theater and fire a shot. And you were quite right, Miss Fenton. Marcia Blair was not shot. She... She wasn't shot. No, take a look at the wound. Oh, I can't look at it. She was stabbed. Stabbed through the right eye oh. with a narrow, sharp blade which entered her brain and killed her instantly. Not a pretty death, but a quick one. You seem to know a lot about this, Governor. Perhaps I do, my friend, and perhaps I can guess a lot more. You mean somebody stood out there and threw a knife at her? Like a ruddy music hall turn? No, I don't mean that either. There's no knife in the wound and none in the box. The murderer took it away. <laughs> took it away? Exactly. Herr von Arnheim, please wait. You're not saying someone climbed up from outside. 20 or 30 feet from the floor and stab poor Marcia in full sight of 3,000 people? That, Miss Fenton, is what the evidence seems to indicate. But it's impossible. Yet it happened. There is Marcia Blair's body. What's that? Oh, it's the warning bell for the second act. People will be coming back here anyway, any minute. What are we going to do? <laughs> Magical effects by Ludwig van Arnheim. Very few persons knew that there is a dead woman in the theater. But at the end of the play, it is a different story. The crowd files out past a cordon of police. The lights are extinguished. The great theater is dark and mumbling with echoes. See the stage now? Only the battens or overhead lights pour down a pale blaze on two men who stand grotesquely against the background of Dunsinane Castle. One of these men is Howard White, very near collapse. The other is Myron Willard himself, still wearing his makeup still wearing helmet and chain mail. And when Willard speaks... Howard! Howard White! Confounded man, can't you hear what I'm saying? Oh, excuse me, madam. I think this is all almost finished. Oh, not that I'm blaming you, old man. <laughs> Thank you, madam. It's traditional, you know, that Macbeth's an unlucky play. But up to the very end, I thought I'd never done better. Eleven curtain calls. No, twelve. Uh, how did you like my tomorrow and tomorrow speech? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, madam. I'm afraid I didn't hear it. Oh, I... Yes, poor old Marcia. She'd have hated to die like that. Marcia was proud of her eyes. Always nearsighted as an owl, but too vain to wear glasses. Uh, there's Von Arnheim looking at us from under the castle archway. Von Arnheim! Did you call me, my friend? You're rather difficult to recognize under all that Macbeth makeup. Yes, I was just thinking the same thing. Uh, never mind that. Uh, where are the police now? 
At the moment, Mr. Wheeler, the police are in your dressing room. They are using it for questioning. Ah. No reception tonight, of course. No, but I thought you might be interested in two items of information that police have just discovered. Well, go on. We had a fairly full house tonight, I believe. Fairly full. Every seat was reserved. Reserved, yes, but not occupied. I don't follow you. One box on the ground floor, box E, to be exact, was empty. Reserved and paid for, but empty. And box E, oddly enough, was just underneath the one occupied by Marcia Blair. Well, all the same, I still don't see quite what you're... Now, our next item of information comes from an usher. An outside eye seat in the stores, very close to that empty box, was occupied by a very curious stranger who arrived late in the dark and slipped out again by a nearby exit a few minutes afterwards. Just one moment, Van Arnheim. Are you saying this stranger climbed up and attacked Marcia in full view of the audience? No, my friend. The murderer did not approach from that direction. Then he must have reached Marcia through the door, guarded by Bradley and Miss Fenton? No, not from that direction either. Confound it, man. It must have been one way or the other. Not necessarily. Well, tell me how. Don't you think I've got enough troubles already without this nightmare on top of it? Herr von Arnheim. Herr von Arnheim. Now, you must take it easy, Miss Fenton. You must not excite yourself. Have the police yes. been... Yes. Pre- Look, you've got to help me. They won't believe me. They won't believe the young lady, sir, and that's a fact. I tried to help her all I can, but... There's things I can swear to and things I can't. You see, I did go into that box. Oh, just for a couple of seconds, I admit it. But no other person went in or could have got in. So they say, or at least they're hinting that I killed her. But I swear I never touched her. Who was questioning you, Miss Fenton? Inspector Grimes or Sergeant Blake? I'm... Well, I'm not sure. The sergeant, I think. Then I shouldn't worry if I were you. Inspector Grimes knows better. He's guessed, in fact, exactly what I have guessed. You seem on rather familiar terms with the police, my friend. I am, Mr. Willard. I am. Anyone who practices escapes from handcuffs, sacks, chests... And stage boxes, perhaps. Stage boxes, if you insist. Excuse me. Isn't that Inspector Grimes in the wings now? Yes, and he's nodding his head. Then I can tell you, I think, what you want to know. Well, if you do happen to know anything, it's your duty to speak up. Or well, Marcia seems to have had some ridiculous idea that her former husband, Barry Lake, was still alive. Her fears weren't justified, of course, and she wasn't killed by any dead husband. I beg your pardon. Her fears were justified, though not quite in the way she believed. And she was killed by her husband. Then Barry Lake is still alive. No, Barry Lake is dead. Well, you don't mean Marcia was really killed by a ghost. No, I mean she was killed by her devoted second husband... Mr. Howard White. Do you know you hear what they say? That's not true. It's a slanderous statement. I, I'll have you in court for it. I, everybody knows how devoted I was to Marcia. Your devotion, my friend, was devotion to her money. And your business affairs have been shaky for a long time. That's not true and you can't prove it. Marcia Blyer was inclined to be, shall we say, a little close-fisted with money. That's true anyway. It's she a lie, a lie. Willing to marry him, but Mr. Howard White knew he'd never touch a penny unless he killed her. He wrote the letters himself. Herr von Arnheim, he can't be guilty. She was alive after he left the box. He wasn't anywhere near her when she died. Perfectly correct, Miss Fenton. He wasn't there, and yet he killed her. Exactly. But you and Bradley can supply the clue that will hang him. Uh, me, sir? I don't know nothing. No, I don't either. I think you do, if you'll put your mind to it. Do you remember what Howard White said to her just before he left the box? Uh, yes, he said, Good night, Marcia. See you in an hour or two. And she answered... Good night and good luck. No, I mean just before that. I... Well, there wasn't anything. Well, you see? It's a slanderous statement without any proof. It's an insult to my position on the stock exchange. Wait. I do remember something rather queer. Think, Miss Fenton, think. He said to Marcia jokingly, if you'll accept these, madam, in honor of our first anniversary. And Marcia said, Howard, they're lovely. Of course I'll accept them. That's right, sir. He did say it. And what do you think he was referring to, Miss Fenton? What was he asking her to accept? Well, I imagined it was flowers, a corsage or something like that. Did you see any flowers in the box or pinned to Marcia Blair's gown? No. I come to think of it, I didn't. Then what did he give her? Uh, don't look at me, sir. Now, here is a woman who is very nearsighted, yet refuses to wear glasses. But she can accept a pair Opera of... Opera glasses. Miss Lie, you can't prove it. Uh, hold on, sir. Go. You better stay here, Governor. Thank you, Bradley. But the place is surrounded with police. But I still don't understand. Now, what happens when you lift opera glasses to your eyes and they are not in focus? You turn the little wheel in the middle to bring them into focus. For Marcia Blair, it was deadly. You mean the 
The glasses had something... Yes, they were specially constructed glasses, Miss Fenton. They were invented by a French criminal years ago. That little wheel is a little trigger. It releases the spring of a sharp, thin blade which strikes through the eyes into the brain. Oh, don't, please. You can't prove it. Marcia Blair died instantly. The glasses torn from her eye by their own weight dropped over the box rail to the carpeted aisle below. The only witnesses who might have noticed would have been the people in the box just underneath. And that box was empty? By arrangement, yes. Even if anybody did see them fall, Howard White was prepared to remove the evidence instantly. You haven't forgotten the curious stranger. Curious stranger? I mean, the man who slipped in after it was dark, took an aisle seat just under the box, and slipped out again a few minutes later. It's a pack of lies from start to finish. You can't prove a word of it. I beg your pardon, my friend. Didn't you see Inspector Grimes not to me a moment ago? Well... You are going to hang, my friend, for one of the neatest and cruelest crimes in my experience. The police have just found those opera glasses with a neat set of fingerprints in the side pocket of your motor car. And so ends Fireburn and Cauldron Bubble, starring the distinguished actor Paul Lucas. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, Ted Osborne, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, same time when Nancy Coleman stars in Fear Paints a Picture. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, Robert Salmon, studio technician, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our distinguished star this evening is that delightful gentleman, Mr. Roland Young, playing as author of detective novels, who invented his best plot when his life was at stake. With Mr. Young to play his long-suffering secretary is Miss Peggy Conklin, a story by John Dixon Carr in a somewhat lighter mood than is our habit and called The Customer's Like Murder, is tonight's tale of suspense. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with The Customer's Like Murder the performance of Roland Young, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. On a hot summer night in a village on the east coast of England, a famous writer of detective stories is dictating to his secretary. You have all heard of Mr. Gerald Hawkstone, celebrated author of Murder on the Wolfpack. Aconite at the Admiralty, Who Shot the Prime Minister, and other thrillers which have held us past the midnight hour. You have followed the exploits of Pendleton King, diplomat detective. Gerald Hopstone lived quietly at Deal with his friend Dr. Roberts nearby in case he should need medical knowledge. And his pretty, if somewhat pert Canadian secretary, Miss Patricia Phillips. Gerald Hopstone would be a happy man, even in wartime. If it's enough. You got all that, Miss Phillips? Yes, Mr. Hawkstone. Good. New paragraph. 
Yes, Mr. Hawkstone. At the head of the great banqueting table, comma, the Lord Chief Justice staggered to his feet, full stop. His face was a ghastly whitish color, and his eyes had become glassy. Is he drunk, Mr. Hawkstone? No, Miss Phillips, the Lord Chief Justice is not drunk. Sounds pretty cockeyed to me. For your information, Miss Phillips, the Lord Chief Justice has just been poisoned with curare because he discovered the identity of the master criminal. Is that clear? Yes, Mr. Hawkstone. But I wish you wouldn't do it. Do what? Well, in the last four books, Mr. Hawkstone, you have shot the Prime Minister, killed the Lord Chancellor with an axe, poisoned the Home Secretary, and blown up the First Lord of the Admiralty. Why don't you stop picking on the poor government and murder somebody else for a change? The Lord Chancellor, Miss Phillips, was not murdered with an axe. No, Mr. Hawkstone? Definitely no. He was beamed with the Great Seal and found dead on the Woolsack. And there's another thing, Miss Phillips. Whether you talk like this because of a dense vacuum in what we will charitably call your mind... Really, Mr. Hawkstone? ...or whether you are really making out what you might define as heart cracks, I don't know. But I don't want any more of it, do you hear? Just as you please, Mr. Hawkstone. I, I... Oh, Lord, where was I? His face was a ghastly whitish color, and his eyes had become glassy. Sounds like me. All right. A single choking cry escaped his lips. Comma. And his body crumpled to the floor. Full stop. New paragraph. With one swift stride, Pendleton King had reached the fallen man. Mm-mm. He can't have done that, Mr. Hawkstone. Who can't have done what? Pendleton King. What about him? Well, on the last page, you had him sitting at the foot of the table. So he can't get there in one stride. Unless you want him to sail across the room like a kangaroo. There are times, Miss Phillips, when I should like to poison you with curare and dance on your grave. <sighs> I was only trying to help. All right, change it, change it, strike it out. With hardly a second's delay, how's that? Comma. Pendleton King had reached the fallen man. Full stop. New paragraph. Quote. I feared it, comma. Close quote. He muttered. Full stop. Quote. Note the rigidity of the muscles. Exclamation point. Note the characteristic odor of curare, which... Mm, that won't do, Mr. Hawkstone. Why not? Curare hasn't got any odor. Now, there, Miss Phillips, you've really gone too far. But I can't help that. It's true. If you will permit the small vanity, I am noted for the correctness of my medical knowledge. Who is murdering the Lord Chief Justice, you or I? You are. But you might murder him properly. Curare hasn't got any odor. I say it has. And I say it hasn't. Listen, Miss Phillips. I propose to settle this rather childish dispute by going next door and asking Dr. Roberts. Will that convince you? Curare hasn't got any odor. Anyway, the Lord Chief Justice wouldn't be mixed up in any such silliness as this. Silliness, eh? Yes, I said silliness. Read your evening paper. The Lord Chief Justice is sentencing some American gangster who got involved in a robbery over here. That's the sort of thing he really does. You're very fond of these gangster reports, aren't you? Yes, I am, because they're real. Real? Ha! Don't you say fa to me. Merely remarking, Miss Phillips, that with your usual ingenuity, you sidetrack the argument. I am going to see Dr. Roberts. That's not necessary, of course. My own knowledge of poisons is as great as that of any doctor. Doctor, far. And finally, kindly don't say far to me, either. When I return, Miss Phillips, I hope to find you in a better frame of mind. Please observe that I, at least, have been able to keep my temper. Excuse me. All right. Go on. See if I care. Excuse me, but... Uh, good evening, Mr. Hawkstone. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Roberts. May I come in? Of course. Mind the blackout curtain. My, isn't it hot and stuffy tonight? Rather close, yes. Is the um, doctor in? I'm afraid he isn't, Mr. Hawkstone. But I expect him back any minute. Oh, out on a call? No, I'm almost certain he isn't. Because that's his medicine case and stethoscope there on the table. I think he's just gone up the road to get some tobacco. Do, do you mind if I wait? Not at all. But uh, you will excuse me if I run along. 
I promised Mrs. Anderson I'd drop in there. It's her neuralgia again, and I'm terribly late already. Don't let me detain you, Mrs. Roberts. Go, go right ahead. I'm afraid you'll have to wait in George's consulting room. I've got most of the house dark so I could keep the windows open. You know which room it is? Yes. Yes, yes, I could, I could find it blindfolded. Oh, uh, and I wonder if you take the medicine case and stethoscope and drop them in the consulting room. George is so careless, he lets them lie about anywhere. Medicine case? Stethoscope, yes. As a matter of fact, I've always wanted to hang one of these things on my neck like this. <laughs> Look almost like a doctor, don't I? Good night, Mrs. Roberts. Good night, Mr. Hawkstone. See you later. Oh, so what I write is silliness, eh? And I don't know anything about poisons. And I call her Miss Phillips instead of Patricia. Ah, here we are. Now, where's that light switch? Good Lord. Come on in, Doc. Close the door. Who the deuce are you? You want to keep healthy, Doc? Just do what you're told. Come in and close the door. Is that by any chance a revolver you're pointing at me? There ain't no cigarette case. I'm warning you. Oh, I'm hanged. I've done it a thousand times in stories, but I never thought... Don't drop that junk you're carrying, either. You're going to need it, Doc, when you come along with me. Come along with you? Where? Just to see a guy, that's all. To see a... Oh, wait a minute. You don't think I'm the doctor? Now, look, Doc. I ain't got any time for gags, see? The boss says to bring you, so I bring you. There'll be a very sick man out there if you don't go. Yes, there'll be a very dead man out there if I do go. I tell you, old man, you're making a terrible mistake. Now, look, Doc. My name is Hawkstone. I live next door. I'm not a medical man, and I never... Somebody's coming. Miss Phillips. Now then, Dr. Hawkstone, just look here in the encyclopedia. So you ain't a doctor, huh? That's done it. Just a real old-fashioned kidder, ain't you? Now you keep quiet, lady. You know, it's good for you. I know you. I've seen your picture. You're big Louie Miller. Pretty smart thing you got here, Doc. I'm... Listen, Mr. Hawkstone. Take it easy, Miss Phillips. Big Louie Miller and Slaps Kelly. Slaps Kelly is the gang leader. Well, we're supposed to be friends of this gangster who's on trial in London now. But I hadn't heard they were in England. No, lady. Neither has anybody else. No, we're for it. Who is this same Dr. Knight? No, she's my secretary. She doesn't know anything about this. She seems to know too much about it, if you ask me. Come on, lady. You're going with it. Going? Where? Just for a little ride, lady. Just for a little ride. <laughs> Far out from the village, in flat and miry swampland, where pools of stagnant water gleam under the moon, stands the old Rutherford house. It is a desolate place, on the track of Field Marshal Goering's bombers when they cross the coastline. But there are no searchlights here, and no guns. Only the heat on the glimmering marshes, and the decaying, weather-boarded house, as a motor car approaches. Drive straight ahead, Doc. Right around to the back of the house. And remember, I still got this rod against the back of your neck. As a matter of fact, Louie, I'm rather enjoying this. All except the murder. What murder? We ain't gonna bump anybody off. Maybe, maybe, maybe not you, old boy, but I am. Just wait till I get at your patient. I don't see how you can joke about this. I'm not joking, Miss Phillips. If Louie won't tell us what's wrong with the patient... Whenever you mind the patient, Doc, you just drive around here. Here, whoa. So... Right here. Oh... So well, this is the enchanted castle, eh? Climb out of here. Walk ahead of me over to that house. Come on, Miss Phillips. That's right, lady. You too. Come on. Hey, hold on, Doc. Grab a can of this cleaning fluid here. You can help me carry it in. Cleaning fluid? Yeah, there's two cans of it. If I can carry one, then I need my other hand for this ride. Come on. Come on. We ain't got all night. Get it out of the back seat. Professionally, this is a little out of my line of duty. What do you want with the cleaning fluid? The boss's suits get all messed up, so I clean them for him. I play nice maid and everything around here. Come on, now. Uh, straight ahead. Stop asking questions. If you got this place blacked out, Louis, if the police don't get you, the air raid warden will. Forget it, Doc. We got this place so sealed up, you can hardly breathe inside. In here? That's right, lady. Go ahead. I'll close the door. I can't see, old boy. Which way? Here. Yeah. Set that can down and follow me. You too, lady. Ah, right here with the curtains hanging over the door. Now, I want you to meet the boss. So I open the curtain like this. Howdy, Doc. Come right in. Glad to see you. I've been expecting you. Glad to see you, old man. I imagine you're the celebrated Mr. Kelly. 
That's me, Doc. Flats, Kelly, to you. Glad to see you taking this nice and friendly. Louis, what's the idea of bringing in the dame? I couldn't help it, boy. Oh. She says nice, see? She was with him. And she knew who I was. She did, eh? I don't know anything. All I want to do is to go home. Ah, that's all right, sister. You'll go home all nice and friendly. As soon as I've had a little talk with the doctor. A talk about what? Well, we're not what you might call comfortable here, Doc. Well, we've got flashlights, canned food, plenty of liquor, portable radio that works on a battery. So we managed to get along. You know what I mean? I said to talk about what? Well, that's it. That's what I'm going to tell you. We pulled a snatch, see? You pulled a snatch? He means they, they, mean they kidnapped somebody. That's right, sister. You speak English. May I ask who was snatched? Well, I'll tell you, Doc, because it'll have you a big laugh. The guy we snatched was the big shot you call the Lord Chief Justice. You snatched the Lord Chief Justice? We sure did, Doc, and his clerk, too. They're in the room right over there. Shut your trap, Louis. I didn't mean nothing, boys. I was only trying to... you hear me say such a trap? Okay. But look here. What, what was the idea behind this snatch? Well, I'll tell you, Doc. We got a pal, see? Well? Dominic Ferrelli, his name is. He's up on a grand larceny rap, and Ferrelli don't like Glimey Jails. He don't like him at all. Besides, the dirty little rat owes me 14 G. So what do we do? Snatch the Lord Chief Justice, apparently. But why? Because the mouthpiece back home tells me long ago that a man can't be sentenced except for the judge that tried him. And the Lord Chief Justice is the judge who tried Dominic Ferrelli, is that it? That's right, Doc. But it ain't the main thing. The Chief Justice is a pretty important guy, see? So what do we do? We write to the cops and say, now look. We got the old bird in a place where you'll never find him, and if you want to keep things nice and friendly, just spring Dominic Ferrelli. Bring him? Turn him loose. Sure. Bring Ferrelli, and you'll get the old judge back in one piece. If you don't do it, you'll get him back with his head as full of holes as a Swiss cheese. And we're not kidding. This is horrible. I can't stand it. Take it easy, sister. Take it easy. You know, Slat, I admire you tremendously. You do, Doc. Why? Because you've invented a crazier idea than I ever did. Just what do you mean by that crack, Doc? You don't honestly think the government will make a bargain with you. I sort of think they will, Doc. I sort of think they will. But what if they don't? It'll be just too bad for a lot of people. You know what I mean? Why wouldn't I like to give that judge a going over? (laughs) Louis got a sort of a sort of a grudge against the old guy, Doc. Why wouldn't you have? Louis temperamental, see? He gets bored easy. So he says to the old guy and his clerk, he says, Can you play poker? Just says, sure. So they play poker from six in the evening to five in the morning. <laughs> what do you know? If the old judge don't win, all Louis do. They rung in a cold back on me. That's how they done it. They're a couple of crooks. Are you accusing the Lord Chief Justice of playing poker with Mark Card? He won Mike Dodd, didn't Shut he? up, Louis. Okay, boy. Not that I blame Louis much. The things I've had to take from that judge. Well, that's where you come in, Doc. I was just wondering about that. Which of one of them is... Uh... Hurt? Nobody hurt. Not yet. Then what the devil do you want with me? I want them kept quiet so they don't keep trying to escape. <gasps> we can't get tough with them, not until I get Pirelli and my 14 Gs. And I want you to give them a hypodermic or something that'll keep them out cold for two days. Can you do that? Why, yes, I, uh, I don't know. I, I suppose I could. Oh, uh... no, for heaven's sake, be careful. Now, what do you use to dope them? Well, under the circumstances and, uh... Considering all the um, factors involved, I think I should use, uh, I should use morphine. Well, have you got any morphine in that black satchel? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Plenty of morphine. I, I always go about equipped for these little emergencies. Well, then open the satchel. Come on, open it. Uh, well, there you are. Dozens of little bottles, anyway. Now then, Doc, which one of them bottles is the one that has the morphine in it? I, the, the fact is, that. Come I on, come on, I... which one is it? Listen, boss. Louie, how many times do I have to tell you to shut up? Yeah, but it's the midnight news. The news on the radio. You said you wanted to hear it. It's after midnight now. Why didn't you tell me? It's all right, boss. I switched the radio on. Well, then keep quiet, all of you. A couple of seconds now, you're going to hear some mighty sweet news. I wonder. So do I. Quiet. And that's us, Anna. The Why? kidnappers, stated Superintendent Hadley of the CID, seem to entertain a belief that no sentence can be passed on a criminal except by the judge who tried him. Whatever may be the law in certain American states, this is not the case here. Dominic Forelli, alias Dominic Stevens, 
with today's sentence by Mr. Justice Stoneman to 14 years hard labor and this evening at a Dartmoor prison. Why, that One moment, please. Oh, cross a lawyer, Take it easy, boy. Take it easy. Kelly, he's as white as a ghost and his mouth is twisting back as though... Here is a bulletin just received. Scotland Yard Flying Squad cars, assisted by the constabulary of a county which for obvious reasons cannot be named, are closing in on the two kidnappers believed to be men already wanted in the United States for murder. That's right. Will anyone who has any further information about these men whose descriptions follow communicate with New Scotland Yard, telephone number Whitehall 121... Just wait till I get my hands on it! That's all right, boys. Everything's all right now. I turned it off. I turned it off. Can't do more than turn it off, Louis. I'll fix that thing. The way to go do, boss. Hey, don't bust the radio! Hey! Oh, you had not on the bus of the radio, boys. Now we can't get any news. We've had our news, A.P. Come on, put that light out. I want to look out the window. Oh, they're closing in. Yeah. Trisha, you see, I can't call you that. Why couldn't you have called me that weeks ago? Oh, well, putting that aside, I thought it was half a joke. But I'm not joking now. I intend to get that rat face slapped if it's the last thing I ever do. It probably will be. But how are you going to? First, Pendleton King, my dear. He's oh, got really? out of worse scrapes uh, than this. 14,000 bucks gone! And the cops on our tail will be standing here yapping. You heard what that radio said, Louie. Yeah, I heard it, all right. Look, boss, we better lamb out of here while sure, it's we will, Louie. Before we go, we settle things with the old guy in the other room. You can't get away with it, Louis. This is England. They'll hang you. So what? We got a murder rapper facing the States, ain't we? And I just as soon hang as fry? What about you, Louie? You said it, boss. Let me take this rod of mine, stick it against the back of the old guy's neck and... Oh, no, no, no. No rod. That's too easy. Easy? Sure. One slug and it's all over. This guy rates special treatment. And that's where the doctor comes in. You know anything about poisons, Doc? I know a good deal about poisons. The customers like murder. What's that? Oh, nothing. Just a slogan in my profession. Look, uh, Louis, do you remember the time Johnny Presco was running the old 3rd Avenue Social Club? Yeah. And Mike Delaney talks out of turn? And they feed him some white stuff called, uh, strychnine? Oh, yeah. And sit around and light cigarettes and watch him die. It took four hours, Doc, and you could hear the rats screaming as far as 81st Street. Now, wait a minute. That's you, Carl. I can't, huh? We'll see. You got any of that white stuff, Doc? Well, I... Come on, I, now. You've might. got something I, I don't in know. that bag that'll make the old guy squeal now, haven't you? Why, yes, I, I suppose well, I listen, have, but... Listen, uh... get this sure. You can do it the hard way, Doc, or you can do it the easy way. Louis gets to work on you. Maybe you'd be smarter to hand the stuff over right now. What do you say? I, uh... Listen, boy. Listen. <clears throat> What's the matter, Seth? Troubled by the heat? It is hot in here with all the windows sealed up. That sounds like planes. It is planes. British planes going over to put the heat on Germany? No such luck, old boy. German planes coming to bomb us. About, uh... About a dozen Heinkels flying 20,000 feet up. Mm-hmm. Very keen here, Miss Phillips. Say, I'd say not over 15. That's the first wave set. There'll be another wave in a minute or two. But you needn't be alarmed. They're going somewhere else. They only... Jack, Louisa! The way I heard you sports, I'm under the table already. Only a little visiting card set and fully a quarter of a mile away. Put out that Why light, Louise. Pull that curtain back off the window. Yeah, that's what's See it. what you can see. Okay. Do what I tell you, big luck. All right, all right. They can't see a thing. The sky's as black as pit. Oh, look over there. Well, what is it? It's a light, boy. Funny kind of a white light. Up there over the tree. It's not very steady. It starts and then... Only a basket of incendiary bombs, Louis. Incendiaries, eh? What is it, Jerry? You got an idea? Louis, this is just what we've been waiting for. Those Scotland Yard cars are going to get held up until we can settle things with those guys in the other room. Come along with me. Why don't you two lugs get smart? Jerry. What's that? You don't want to have your neck cracked on a rope, do you? Or burn in the electric chair back home? What are you getting at? Why not take advice from somebody who's been killing people in a professional way for 15 years? I'm not in the mood for gags, Doc, but keep on talking. This law chief justice and his clerk, what do they look like? Well, the judge is a little guy with a bald head like me. And the other one is a big guy with a punch-drunk pan like Louie. Why? I thought so. I've seen that photograph. When the next wave of planes comes over, and it will, why shouldn't an incendiary bomb hit this house? You mean you think I ain't too safe here? Be quiet, Louie. Go ahead, Doc. In other words, you leave the Lord Chief Justice and his clock tied up in the other room. Then all you have to do is to set fire to the place. Justice cheated, Medlington gangsters die and blaze. Jerry Hawkstone, have you gone crazy? They may catch you eventually, yes. But it'll give you a few days' start. Hey, maybe you got something there, Doc. It's got to look good. 
This house was got like a piece of paper in a furnace. Past any possibility of being put out. Yeah, and that's the catch. Why so? Now, this house is in the middle of a swamp, see? It's as damp as your own climate. You couldn't make it burn with a blowtorch. Oh, yes, you could. Aren't you forgetting the cleaning fluid? Cleaning fluid? In that other room, you've got two gallons of cleaning fluid. That's benzene, a derivative of petrol. Soak every inch of the floor of that room with it, every inch of it, mind, and the place will go up like tinder. Well, it's worth a try, Louis. Turn on your flashlight. Okay, boss. And, uh, what about you too, Doc? Afterwards? We're accessories, aren't we? Are we likely to talk? Better put a couple of slugs in them, boss, and drop them on the road. What's one or two more bumps in a spot like this? Maybe you're right at that. Well, anyway, Doc, thanks for a swell idea. You heard what the doc said, Louis. Get going with that cleaning step. Both of you had better do it. I'm warning you. Oh, why? Hear that? Because there isn't much time. Here they come. You can't have a fire start after the last wave of planes has gone over. Well, maybe you got something there, too. But I'll just take a little precaution first. What are you going to do? These are handcuffs, sister. Two of the neatest pair of cuffs we ever swiped off a dumb cop. Now, I'll just lock your arms around the back of the chair, like this. And the doc's arms around the back of his chair, like this. And we'll get going. Come on, Louis, through the curtain. Okay, I'm coming, boys. Bye-bye, Mr. Hawkstone. And your lady friend, be saying you're in the funny papers. Go in the morgue. <laughs> it won't be long now. They must have everything in there soaked with that benzene by now. Jerry, I know you can't be completely crazy. Many thanks, my dear, for the qualification. You're right. They have soaked the place with benzene. And if they strike a match before... I know, I know you, you've got some kind of a scheme, but do you think it'll work? I don't know, my dear. I thought of it once for a story. Oh, you and your story. Me and my stories, as Louis will put it, may save our hides yet. But suppose it doesn't work. Then we're done for. What are you trying to do? There's a place to miss, boy. Yeah, I got it. Listen. Fisher. It's not working. But, but it's got to work. What's got to work? Four, no. Five minutes. Be at least that, then... They've been pulling out that benzene an inch at a time all over the... What's that? What's the matter? Listen, listen. What's the matter, you big lad? Did you stand up? Something's got me. It's working, Patricia. I think our friends are licked. No. No, they're not. Slaps is coming back. What? What? They're <coughs> tricky, you... Trying to pull, Doc. What's the matter with Louis? What's the matter with me? You've lost the game, Slats. You're finished. Okay. I'm finished, am I? It's the benzene fumes, old man. Pour out a lot of cleaning fluid in an airtight room like that one is practically a certain death. You know, Slats, you ought to learn more about crime. <coughs> no, you won't, Slats. You can't reach your gun. The fumes have got you. You can't move your arms or legs. Your eyesight's going. In one second more, you'll be... Got him. Dead to the world. You mean... It worked, Patricia. It's practical. It worked. Are you... Trying to tell me that you kill those two men? Not necessarily. Listen. That sounds like cars. Probably police cars. We're just about to be sensationally rescued, just like fiction. Jerry. Jerry. Come on out of there. Come on in and get us, you lug. Well, don't talk like Louie, or we'll get a bullet through the head yet. Yes, yeah, that is a thought. Well, we're prisoners. We're victims. This way, please. Hit the sergeant, and I was never so glad to see a uniform in my life. Here now, here now. What's going on in this place? Louis Miller knocked out in that room? And blimey, if it's not Slats Kelly knocked out in this room. Just a couple of mugs I polished off, sergeant, all in the day's work. You mean they're dead? They'll be all right if you drag them out in the open air. Oh, you, I recognize you. You're the writer who was kidnapped tonight. Yes, and you will find the other snatches in that room. But first of all, have you got a key that'll unlock regulation police handcuffs? I certainly have, sir, and I'll get you loose in a jiffy. Never mind me, Sergeant. Never mind my handcuffs. Get this lady free. She's the one I'm concerned about. You know, that's awfully kind of you. It's something practically chivalrous. Chivalry, my eye. There you are, young lady. Have you got your notebook and pencil in that handbag? You don't want me to take dictation now. A true artist, madam, takes no account of time or place. Are you ready? Yes, Mr. Hawkstone. Well, you admit now that my plot is practical. Yes, Mr. Hawkstone. Now then, The Income Tax Murder by General Hawkstone, Chapter One. But, Mr. Hawkstone... Just as Big Ben was striking midnight, a hooded face looked into the window of the luxurious study 
occupied by the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Full stop. The hooded figure chuckled as it softly lowered inside the window a large tin of cleaning fluid. New paragraph. The Chancellor himself was hard at work devising a new scale of income tax. But Mr. Hawkstone, that's a completely different story. I thought you were going to murder the Lord Chief Justice. Haven't you any professional taste? How can I murder the Lord Chief Justice? I just saved his life. So ends The Customers Like Murder, starring Roland Young with Peggy Conklin. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, same time, when our story will be The Dead Sleep Lightly. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, elaborated on tonight's suspense. Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Peter Lorre, playing the part of the Hungarian Count Stefan Kahari, a gentleman of sinister aspect. The story is by John Dixon Carr, who calls it The Devil's Saint. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution till the last possible moment. And so, it is with the Devil's Saint and Mr. Peter Lorre's performance, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. The Devil's Saint. Paris, 15 years ago. Paris as it used to be, when lights twinkle from the old Trocadero to the hill of Sacre Coeur, when taxicabs honked and the beat of tango swayed, and Chinese lanterns gleamed above the lake in the Bois, when, in short, you and I were young. Come then to the President's Ball at the Opera, St. Catherine's Day, 1927. A fancy dress ball at the Opera, filling these marble halls with a multitude of masks and a multitude of dreams. The mosaic decorations are no less bright than the colors that weave here. Harlequins and Columbine, Cleopatra and Musketeers. In the great marble foyer, remember it? They have set out little tables and lines of palms behind which you may sit screened. Look at one such table. A young man wearing the scarlet and gold uniform of an English guards officer in Wellington's day. A dark-haired young girl in the costume of a bacante. <laughs> and as we approach... Ned, don't please, you must well, Why not? You really don't mind, do you? No, of course I don't mind, only you mustn't. Oh, Ned. Look here, Alona. We've got to settle this thing. You have enjoyed being here tonight, haven't you? Ned, I've loved it. After being cooped up at my uncle's place in the country, it's like heaven. All right. When I take you back to the hotel, I'm going to face this uncle of yours tonight. No. No, please don't. I'm going to say that you and I intend to get married, and that's that. I can't marry you, Ned. I've told you that. But why not? 
Just give me one good reason. Because I can't. My uncle, he would never allow it. Never. And that seems to you a good reason enough? Yes, Ned. This uncle of yours, uh, what's his name? Count Stefan Kohari. He's a Hungarian, I think you said. Yes, so am I. My mother was an American. Well, what's he like, actually? Oh, he's a little eccentric. Mm -hmm. Oh, please don't misunderstand. He's a great scholar and a historian, only... He's a little strange. He... Ned. What is it? There he is now. Your uncle? Yes, that elegant man in plain evening clothes with the Order of the Golden Fleece across his chest. Oh, I see him. Oh, he looks as black as a thundercloud. He's throwing those two dressed as devils aside as though they didn't exist. Give me my mask quick before he sees us. No, Elona. Why not? We'd better face this out now. Sit still. Good evening, Elona. Good evening, Uncle Stefan. Uncle, may I present Edward Whiteford? How do you do, sir? How do you do? Elona, do you think that costume is quite the thing to wear in public? Why not? Well, an older generation might call it immodest. It looks like... Like uh, what? Nothing. Will you go and get your cloak or your domino or whatever you wore here? Uncle, please don't make me go home so soon. It's hardly 11 o'clock. I was not asking you to go home, my dear. I was merely asking you to put on a wrap. All right, I'll get it. You stay and talk to Ned. I shall be delighted. Will you sit down, sir? Thank you. <laughs> You seem to have quite a gathering at this table. Oh, yes. Some friends of mine from the embassy, they're upstairs dancing now. <laughs> well, <laughs> look, glasses, glasses, and still more glasses. <laughs> you know, I was quite an adept once at uh, musical glasses. Have you ever tried it, young man? <laughs> well, it's very easy. You take a spoon like this, you see, and... <laughs> like it? Well, forgive me, sir, but there's something I'd like to ask you. Yes? I don't know exactly how to say this, so I'd better say it in the shortest way. I want to marry your niece. Well, look out, sir. You smashed one of the glasses. A few francs will pay for that. But there are other things of higher value, at least to me. Well, maybe I ought to mention first that my full name is Lord Edward Whiteford. My father's the Earl of Grey. Indeed. <laughs> well, I only mention that to show we're, well, respectable enough. Well, the British ambassador will vouch for me, sir, if you'd like to ring him up. And perhaps I ought to mention that uh, I've always kept Ilona carefully guarded from the world. Almost too carefully guarded, don't you think? That, Lord Edward, depends on my reasons. Sorry, sir. You have known Ilona about how long? Four days. Four days. You wouldn't even choose a business partner in four days. Yet to want to marry my Ilona... After four days. Well, we know our own mind, sir. You do, huh? <laughs> then you know more than the wisest man in this world. However, as one whose dearest wish is Elona's happiness, I... I hope it is, Count Kohari. Do you doubt what I say? Oh, no, sir. <laughs> well, I will make you a proposition. <laughs> I own an estate in Turin, not far from Paris, sir. A little chateau, a few hundred acres, fishing... Very good stable of horses. I know. Lona told me. Oh, she did. Well, then here is my suggestion. Why not come down and visit us for a week or two? Oh, that's very decent of you, sir. Oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> and uh, if at the end of that time you're not cured of this infatuation... Oh, it's not an infatuation. I swear it's not. No? Well, if at the end of that time you're not cured uh, permanently of this feeling, you may take Ilona. And with my blessing, that's fair, isn't it? Oh, it's more than fair, Uncle Harry. I don't know how to thank you. Oh, well, please, don't even try. <laughs> and at least I can promise you a very interesting experience. You see, at the Chateau d'Azé, there is one certain bedroom. We call it the tapestry room. Yes? Well, uh, I assure you, it'll be very interesting for you to sleep in that room. Why? Is it haunted or something? Oh, no. <laughs> No, 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 not haunted. <laughs> well, now, if you don't mind, I shall say good night, and I hope I can trust you to bring Ilona safely to the hotel. Au revoir. Look over there. What is it, sir? Just look. Streams of our fellow guests pouring down the main staircase. 
shapes of nightmare, shapes of delirium, insane dead masks. Only the eyes move. Wouldn't we be terrified, perhaps, if we would look behind those gargoyle faces? Oh, no, I don't think so. They're only ordinary people like ourselves. That sure is uh, where you make your mistake. Well, I shall expect you for the weekend, and uh, encore une fois, au revoir. It's all right, Alona. You can come out from behind those palms. What was he saying? I couldn't hear. Alona, it couldn't be better. Well, he's a very decent old boy, actually. And he's invited me to the Chateau d'Azé. Did he say anything about the tapestry room? Yes. He invited me to sleep there. And you said? I said I would, naturally. You mustn't do it, Ned. I won't let you do it. But why the devil not? Because everybody who sleeps in that room dies. Dies? Are you serious? Oh, Ned, please don't do it. Oh, nonsense. There are a lot of superstitions about every old house. This isn't a superstition, Ned. It happened once when I was a little girl. A man insisted on sleeping there. They found him dead in the morning. So? How did he die? They don't know. There wasn't a mark on his body. He wasn't shot or stabbed or strangled or poisoned or hurt in any way. He was just dead. Two nights later, in the province of France, now known as Under Elaware, but once called Touraine, the ancient land beloved of Rabelais and Balzac. But now, as the wind moans down the valleys, and rain flickers across the apple trees and thunder stirs in those haunted hills. It can bring little comfort to a young man driven in an ancient carriage from the railway station along snake-like roads. To what destination? Ahead, a lift of lightning shows the gray walls and conical slate-roofed towers of a chateau set some distance back from the road. Light shine from its narrow windows, dimly seen through the rain as... Driver! Coachman! Oui, monsieur. Is that the Chateau d'Azé up ahead? Oui, monsieur. I will take you to the very door if... Uh... If what? Why do you cross yourself? If I am permitted. What should stop you? Only fear, monsieur. And I am not much afraid. Just... What was that? Only the dogs, monsieur. They keep many dogs, large dogs, at the Chateau d'Azay. Well, here we are. Bonsoir, monsieur. And if I may be permitted a word of advice. Well? Beware of the tapestry room. There isn't a bell on this door. There might at least be a knocker. Ah, oh, got it. Et alors, monsieur? Vous cherchez? Je cherche le château d'Azé. Et je... je, uh, je uh, uh, perhaps it would uh, be better if monsieur spoke English, yes? You are Lord Edward Whitefall. Yes. Monsieur is expected. Please to enter. Monsieur's at and cool. Thank you. Ned. Hello, Elona. Oh, I brought the palm up a teeth for the uncle. Oh, you'd better not kiss me, Ned. Madame Flay says to look out for my uncle. Madame Flay is our housekeeper. Oh. Well, where's your uncle now? In the drawing room. He's playing the piano. Come along. Elona, is anything wrong? Oh, everything's wrong. Two of my dogs were in horrible pain this afternoon. Dr. Solomon had to put them out with chloroform. You don't think that... I hope nobody's practicing, that's all. Well, here we are. Oh, nice tiger skins on the floor. I say, who's the little old man with the gray beard sitting over there by the fire? That's Dr. Solomon. <laughs> Hasn't he funny-looking eyes? He watches and watches and watches. He's an old friend of the family. Shh, come along. Let's get this over with. Oh, 
Ah, Lord Edward. <laughs> well, I see my niece has anticipated me. Welcome to the Chateau des Ailes. Thank you, Count Harry. Oh, you must be very wet after your long drive. Go up to the fire and warm yourself. Uh, uh, Madame Flay. Yes, monsieur. Uh, please tell Antoine to take our guest's luggage up to the tapestry room. The tapestry room, monsieur? That is what I said, Madame Flay. Yes, monsieur. By an odd coincidence, Lord Edward, Dr. Solomon and I were just discussing the fate of the last person who slept in a tapestry room. This is not good, my friend. This is against my advice. <laughs> it's against his advice. <laughs> Here, Dr. Solomon croaked. This is not good, I tell you. It is the wrong season of the moon. Uh, the wrong moon. <laughs> but there is no moon tonight. It's raining cats and dogs. Don't talk about dogs. Nevertheless, it is the wrong season of the moon. I say no more. Cheerful blunder, that doctor. Don't do it, Ned. I won't be responsible if they make you do it. But uh, look here, Count Kohari. What did happen to the last bloke who slept in the tapestry You mustn't call him a bloke, sir. He was a very saintly gentleman. The Bishop of Tours. That was some time ago when Delona was only 15 years old, but uh, surely she must remember it. I remember it. The church, said our bishop, has no use for superstitions. Well, <laughs> he insisted on sleeping there. I, I made it as comfortable for him as possible, but he was found dead next morning with a crucifix still in his hand. Was it poison? There was no poison, monsieur. No. <laughs> Here, Dr. Solomon. It's true, Ned. Well, they were just two very curious things. You see, in uh, connection with that death, on a mantelpiece there was found burning a stick of incense. Just ordinary incense, nothing wrong with it. Yes, sir. And uh, under the dressing table, the police found it with an empty jar of ointment. Now, use your wits. A dead man... Some burning incense and an empty jar of ointment. What do you make of that? Oh, I don't make anything of it. It's crazy. Please do not speak like that. I'm sorry? It is still the wrong season of the moon. <laughs> well, what I really meant, sir, was this. Is, is there any reason for this story of death? A reason? Uh, any legend attached to the room or anything like that? Yes, there is. Well, sir? Well, we are a very old family, Lord Edward. Old and perhaps accursed. When my ancestors moved from Hungary to France in the 17th century, they brought certain beliefs with them. The old religion. The old religion? Yes, the cult of Diana, the cult of Janus, the cult of freedom and fertility. The witch cult, if you prefer. Oh, now look here, sir. Must we talk about this? Well, you smile, but... Uh... When I say the word witch, you think of some humorous picture on a Halloween's card. It was very different in the Middle Ages, believe me. Then, my friend, there existed an organized religion which rivaled the church. There were many to worship unashamed at the Grand Sabbath. Many to receive all favors from Satan, their master, and to dance forever joyously in the red, flaming quadrilles of hell. Now, some 200 years ago, an ancestress of mine, Katerina Kohari, was tortured to death in a tapestry room for professing the old religion. Many persons have not thought it safe to sleep there since. Are you answered? Oh, come, sir. This is some kind of elaborate joke. Hmm? Joke? The Bishop of Tours did not find it a joke. Not a mark on his body. I assure you as a physician, not a mark on his body. <laughs> no, not a mark on his body. <laughs> Here, Dr. Solomon. Yes, I hear him. Well, understand me, Lord Edward, there's no compulsion in this. If you do wish to sleep in that room, all right? Oh, if you don't, I'm not room. afraid to sleep there, sir. Well, I thought perhaps you want to change your mind. Oh, never. Would you like me to make a wager on that? What sort of wager? Well, if I spend the night in this famous room and come out of it alive... Yes? Will you give your consent to the marriage immediately? Tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning? Why? Because I don't think the atmosphere of this house is good for a loner. What do you say? Will you do it? Very 
Very well, Lord Edward. I accept the terms of your wager. Don't do it, Ned. For the love of heaven, don't do it. High up in the north tower of the Chateau de Zay, under the conical slate roof is the circular room hung with faded tapestries. These tapestries move slightly with uneasy, mimic life to the clamor of the storm outside. Candles burn along the mantelpiece and beside the great four-poster bed. The flames of these candles waver, too, as the door opens. This is the tapestry room, monsieur. Thank you, Madame Flay. That is the mantelpiece where the incense burned. That is the bed where Monsignor Le Bishop died. Very inviting, isn't it? Will there be anything else Monsieur requires? Some sandwiches, a decanter of whiskey? Oh, no, thanks. I had a drink with the Count Kohari before I came upstairs. Pierre, Monsieur? Uh, Monsieur's shaving water will be brought up in the morning. If he requires it. Good night. Hoppy, trying to scare a fellow out of his wits just because... Oh, I hope they've built a good fire anyway. Didn't realize how cold it was. Temperature must have dropped. What's that? It's me, Elona. May I come in? No, Elona, get out of here. That's not very gallant of you. No, I mean, I, I don't want you exposed to whatever it is. Ned, listen. Are you going to bed? Or are you going to sit up all night? I'm going to sit up all night, naturally. Then... Let me sit up with you. No. Why not? Well, it may be dangerous. Besides, I promised your uncle I'd go through with this alone. I wish you hadn't had that drink with him. Why? He couldn't have done anything to it. It was you who poured it. Yes, that's true, what? only... Listen. What is that? It sounds like footsteps. Yes, but where's it coming from? Seems to be right here in the room. It seems to come from all directions. Doesn't it sound like somebody walking between the walls? By George, it is someone walking inside the wall. Get behind that tapestry, Lona. Quick. Hide there. Yes. Count Kohari. Where did you come from? Oh, forgive me, Lord Edward, for seeming to appear out of the wall and between the tapestries. <laughs> like Mephisto appearing too fast, huh? <laughs> and this red dressing gown perhaps adds to the effect, too. <laughs> How'd you get here? A passage between the walls? Yes, exactly. A little device my ancestors for visiting this room. You know, they invented that when its occupant was so unmanly as to bolt the door. <laughs> Door's not bolted. You could have walked straight in. But I couldn't have done it unobserved. No. Maybe not. Have you had any other visitors? Lord Edward? No. Are you quite sure of that? Quite sure. Well, then, uh, since nobody saw me come here, I'll just sit down by the fire. <laughs> Please sit opposite me. Is this the showdown, sir? Hmm? I don't understand. Well, there's got to be a showdown between us. Is that why you're here? Oh, I'm here, young man, to explain certain things to you. Uh, will you have a cigarette? Thank you. I... Oh. <laughs> They're perfectly all right. That is what you're afraid of? I'll have one, yes. A light? Thank you. Well, when I was discussing the witch cult a while ago, you didn't appear to think I meant what I said. Do you want a perfectly frank answer to that? Yes. I think you're mad enough to mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> what you say, in a sense, is quite true. Seeing an old and uh, inbred family like ours, the mind can crack in the fantasies of witchcraft, become as real, well, more real than the living world. Let me give you an example. Go on. The saucer on the table beside you is Ming porcelain. It was once owned by Katerina Kohari, a martyr of the old religion. Yet you are using it as an ash tree. Oh, I beg the witch lady's pardon. I'll blow off the ash. Well, that's a very dangerous remark, sir. Don't you understand that the worship of evil can be as strong and compelling as the worship of good? That the devil can have his saints, too? That 
to a sick brain which knows but can't help itself, you have profaned this room merely by entering it. And therefore, you deserve to die. Like the Bishop of Tours? Exactly. You're not going to tell me the devil killed him. The devil's agent may be flesh and blood. Then it was murder. Oh, of course it was murder. Murder so cunningly contrived that no one ever saw through it. Go on. I asked you before to use your wits on this problem. Well, look, incense was burned in this room. You know why? Suppose you tell me. Well, obviously, I think, to conceal something else, which would be too easily noticed. To conceal what? For instance, the smell of chloroform. Chloroform? Yes. A drug not really well understood by layman. Dr. Solomon, by the way, was using chloroform this afternoon to dispose of some dogs. So I've heard. Well, Dr. Solomon is old and uh, very forgetful. You mean chloroform could be stolen? Oh, yes, it could be easily. Now, suppose, I mean, just suppose I take a pad saturated with chloroform. I place it over the mouth and nostrils of a man already sleeping or drugged so that he gets no air. Wait a minute. That, that won't do. Why not? Chloroform burns and blisters when it touches the skin. You leave marks. Oh, not at all, my friend. Not at all. If I first covered the mouth and nostrils with some substance like... Uh, Ointment. Yes. Now you're waking up. Hi. Now observe what follows. In a few seconds, unconsciousness. In two minutes or three minutes, death. Certain death, yes. Oh, but chloroform, you see. <laughs> It evaporates very quickly. There is no trace in the stomach since nothing has been swallowed. Well, delay your post-mortem for 24 hours. Very easy matter in these country districts, and no trace remains in the blood. Murder without a mark, Lord Edward. Murder without a mark. You can't do it, Count Kohani. There's one thing you're forgetting. What is that? I'm not sleeping, and I'm not drugged. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> How? When? In the cigarette? Hmm? No. In a drink you had with me. What was it? Morphine. And you've had enough to put three men to sleep. Ah. <gasps> See, that's it. Well, try to get up. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> you see? You've knocked over the fire irons. You'd have been in a fire yourself if I hadn't caught Take you. your hands off me. Just as you please. Oh, if I could reach that bell pull. Well, but you can't. Well, better sit down again. You murdering lunatic. So that's how you killed the Bishop of Tours. And that's how you're going to kill me. Who, I? Well, you don't think I killed the Bishop of Tours. Didn't you? You fool. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to save you. Dr. Solomon. Yes, monsieur. Let well, come out, come out. Come in the room. Come out and be my witness. Yes, monsieur. I shall always guard the family honor, even when I guess how men die. This young man evidently thinks I've been talking about myself. Am I in a popular parlance insane? Oh, monsieur. Heaven forbid. I have never known a saner man. Have you any notion, Lord Edward, why I brought you to this house? You would never have believed me. If I had merely told you. So I had to bring you here to show you. Show me what? What? <laughs> uh, look, look at the tapestries. Come out of there. Behind them. Come out of there. Hey, come out. Ilona. Yes. Yes, Ilona. Why do you think I've kept Ilona so well guarded from the world? Why, at a fancy dress ball, for instance, did I object to the costume of a medieval witch whose dogs were poisoned? So that chloroform should be brought. Who poured the drink drugged with morphine? In the devil's name, what are you trying to tell me? It was Ilona. <laughs> She's been helplessly, hopelessly insane for more than ten years. <laughs>
And so closes The Devil's Saint, starring Peter Lorre. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. of mental uncertainty, usually accompanied by apprehension or anxiety, fear of something which is about to occur as, do not keep me any longer in suspense. For our story of suspense tonight, we invite you to enjoy The Devil in the Summer House by John Dixon Carr. Somewhere along the Hudson, perhaps not far from Terrytown, there is a modest house in its own grounds. Behind it, in a spacious garden, stands a summer house of evil memory. More than 25 years ago, a man shot himself, or at least died, in that summer house. They found Major Kenyon with a scorched bullet hole in his head and the weapon beside him. But we are in the present now. The latticed summer house has grown heavy with vines. And only the other evening, two men came into that garden at twilight, over the shaggy grass, as a storm was brewing along the Hudson. Two men. The lawyer from New York. Who's there? And Captain Burke of the Homicide Squad. Easy, my friend, easy. Easy. I was just going to ask you the same thing. My name is Parker. I'm an attorney. You're not Captain Burke. Yeah, the very same and no other. I thought I recognized you, Mr. Parker. Must be something important to bring you so far from New York at this time of night. I was in Tarrytown anyway. I thought there'd be a housekeeper here. But I don't see any lights. You've got business here? Yes, in a way. Have you? I don't know. I'll tell you better after you tell me what brought you to a place that no one has lived in for ten years. Tell me, Captain. Did you ever get an anonymous letter from a dead man? Did you? No, I can't say I did. The letter's anonymous. How do you know the man's dead? Because they're all dead. 
Every last one of them. Dead and under the ground where they can't be hurt any longer. Look. There's the summer house where Jerry Kenyon used to work. There are the windows of the library and the dining room. Looking toward us. Confound this lightning. Makes the windows blaze, don't it? Jerry Kenyon hadn't a care in the world. Yet he shot himself. I'll show you the letter. Now, look, Mr. Parker, I couldn't read anything in this light. But if we can get inside the house Certainly now... we can get into the house. I was the family attorney. I've got the keys. Why should a dead person send me a letter? working, eh? But you got a flashlight, I see. Came here prepared for anything, eh? This is the library. There were always candles on the mantel. Uh, yes, there they are. Have you a match, Captain? Oh, uh, yes, I'll light them. Uh, that's better. Same old heavy furniture. Same old thick carpet, same old globe map. Now, uh, Mr. Parker, this letter that you were talking about. Yeah. Read it. Hey, wait a minute. This thing is dated November 2nd, 1918. That's right, and be careful of that paper. You see how old it is? But it was mailed yesterday. From where? I don't remember. I didn't keep the envelope. Read it. Dear Joe. In case you didn't know it, I'm Joe. Dear Joe, if you want to know how Major Kenyon really died... But we know how he died. It was suicide. Are you sure it was? Whoever wrote this letter doesn't seem to think so. If you want to know how Major Kenyon really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. Press hard at the back of the drawer, yours very truly. That's not signed. That's right. Now, are you sure you don't know who wrote that letter? This is the first time I've been back in this room, Captain. It was almost a home to me once. There's the chair where Isabel sat on the afternoon it happened. Isabel was Jerry Kenyon's wife, beautiful woman. There's the door that the maid let me in by that afternoon. You know, Captain, it seems to me they're all here tonight. Who? Oh. We stand beneath the sounding rafter, and the walls around us are bare as they echo our peals of laughter. It seems that the dead are there. Yet we stand to our glasses steady. You know it? I was in my school reader. How does the rest of it go? Yet we stand to our glasses steady. And drink to our comrades' eyes. Here's a glass to the dead already. Hurrah for the next that dies. Excuse me, Captain. I don't know what's come over me talking that way. I was very fond of these people. Are you going to look in the desk drawer? This is a lot of nonsense. Then why are you here, Mr. Parker? Jerry Kenyon was always a happy man. At least that's what I always thought. Big, boisterous fellow. Yeah? He had a good position with Vitatone. You know, the phonograph company. Yeah, sure I know him. But he'd just been made a major in the army. 1917. There was a war on then, too, if you remember. I remember. To make the world safe for democracy. Old days. Old heartaches. Old memories. I remember that blazing hot day in August when all the windows were up. I remember this room and Isabel, that was Jerry's wife, sitting in that chair, knitting. I remember...
Oh, yes, Kitty. What is it? There's a man to see you, Miss Ken, and he says his name's Parker. Yes, I'm expecting him. Uh, show him in, please. All right, ma'am. Shall I take your knitting in your knitting bag? Why should you take my knitting? I don't know, Miss Kenyon. I just wondered. You can come in now. Thank you. Hello, Joe. Hello, Isabel. You sent for me? Joe, I must apologize for Kitty. Servants are getting to be a problem nowadays. She looks pretty enough to get along. Oh, Kitty's got large ideas. She wants to go on the stage, if you please, and do imitations, like Miss Draper. She only knew how hard it was acting all your life. Isabel, you've been crying. I have not. At least... Is that why you sent for me? I've missed you. You haven't been here in over a week, Joe. I had an idea Jerry was getting a little tired of having me around this house. Oh, no, Joe. Why, Jerry... Yes, what about Jerry? I wish I knew, Joe. That's why I wanted you here. Where is he, by the way? I want to say goodbye to him before he leaves. He's probably out in the summer house where he works with all those papers. He's got a lot of work to catch up with. He's going overseas tomorrow. Yes, I know. He's out there. He's been out there all day. His last day here. and I've been alone. That sounded like a shot. <laughs> yes, it was a shot, Joe. In the house. Dear. Doesn't seem to worry you. <laughs> it's only Paul. Jerry's brother, Paul. Oh. Thought you'd gotten him off your hands for good. Jerry asked him out. He got here two nights ago. That doesn't make it any easier for you, does it? No, oh, I don't mind. Jerry's fixed him up with a pistol range in the cellar. Paul's a terribly bad shot. Not like the rest of us. You don't seem to like it, Joe. Uh, shall I have Kitty go down and tell him? No, no, about? no. It's terrible. As long as he keeps away. Poor Joe. But, uh, about Jerry. Who is it this time? Joe, Jerry's been home five days on leave from camp. Well, uh, never mind what camp. But he spent four evenings of those five with... With that Fisk woman. Diane Fisk? The redhead with all the money? Oh, she got money? Well... She must have some attraction, then. Please understand me, Joe. It's not that I'm jealous any longer. It's just that... No, no, that of course not. Jerry goes his way, and I go mine. I may not be without admirers myself, if it comes to that. You've no idea how true that is, Isabel. No, uh, I was thinking about Jerry... He may not always be lucky. He may meet some girl who's not as broad-minded as I am. And then when he gives her the go-by... Oh. Paul must be getting really furious down in that cell. He's not hitting anything. He must be using a lot of ammunition. Now, your trouble, Joe, is that you're too much of a gentleman. And if you really want to see Jerry, uh, there he is now. Where? Uh, just standing in the door of the summer house. Uh, look out the window. And finally, bright out there. Doesn't he look noble in his new uniform? Sam Brown belt and revolver and everything. Well, look how he turns around and waves his cap at us. Like a real soldier. Real soldiers don't exactly wave their caps, do they? He does. Uh, Jerry! Jerry! Hello there! Jerry, Joe Parker's here. Who? Joe Parker. He wants to see you. Into the summer house again. Not a care in the world, Harry. Now, you? listen, Isabel, you've got to slow down. You'll be crying again in a minute. Come on over here and sit down. Uh, light hurts my eyes, that's all. Well, then we'll just pull these blinds. We'll still be able to see. There, how's that? It's better, thanks. Now, can you. I get you anything? Oh, no. You heard the great white chief's orders. I'm to get you something. Uh, what do you have, Joe? A highball? Don't bother with that. Oh, it's no bother. Everything's out in the dining room here. The Iceman didn't deliver today of all days, so I'm afraid I can't give you any ice. I uh, read in the paper yesterday that we're likely to have automatic ice boxes any day now. Uh, you know, uh, things that freeze ice by electricity or something. Uh, do you believe that, Joe? I doubt it. Listen, Isabel. Uh, here you are. It's not cold at all. It's the best I could do. Thanks, Emma. What I wanted to say was, couldn't you get that brother of yours to give up practicing now? Hasn't he done his good deed for the day? <laughs> Yes, maybe he has. Uh, I'll ring for Kitty. You don't have to call me, Miss Canyon. I'm here. Oh, yes, Kitty. What is it? It's only to tell you there's another visitor. This time it's a woman. Lady Kitty. Call her a lady, please. Well, maybe. She says her name's Diane Fisk. 
Diane Fisk, that's Jerry. Uh, Kitty, tell the lady I'm not in. Lady. <laughs> She's a fine lady. I don't want to intrude, my dear. I don't want to intrude. <clears throat> anyway, it's too late, Miss Kenyon. She's coming down the hall now. My dear Mrs. Kenyon. <laughs> How do you do, Diane? <laughs> This is a friend of ours, Miss Fisk, uh, Mr. Parker. Oh, now, I don't want to intrude, really, I don't. I wouldn't have intruded for worlds, especially on a day like this. Isn't it awful? But your husband simply insisted, my dear Mrs. Kenyon, he simply wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> I'm sure he wouldn't. Uh, do you know what he's brought from his office as a surprise? No. A phonograph recording machine. He's going to let us use it. So that we can all hear ourselves talk twice. How nice. <laughs> name can't somebody stop that firing don't fly off the handle take it easy now kitty yes ma'am would you please go down the cellar and tell mr kenyon's brother he's driving us all crazy tell him to stop yes ma'am oh, my dear mrs kenyon i do hope i haven't offended you in any way i i know i'm a silly little chatterbox they say people who have red hair often are <laughs> because at your age you you must find the heat very dry uh, don't you think we'd all better sit down i i think... was very much interested in what miss fisk said about our phonograph recording machine Mrs. Kenyon was just talking about a machine to make ice. Yes, yes. Isn't science wonderful? But I do think it was mean of Major Kenyon to invite me out here and then go and fall asleep in the summer house. Oh. Did you say fall asleep? Yes, of course. How did you know? Well, I came up the back way and I saw him in the summer house with his head forward on the table, taking a nice little snooze. That's very queer. Of course, you couldn't see much except in the bright light of the door, but I think I saw him there. I didn't disturb him, naturally. But I think I'd better disturb him. Oh, now, please don't trouble on my account. The fact is, my dear, I don't altogether trust myself in this room. A woman of my age has to conserve his strength, you know. So if you'll just excuse me... I'm... Well, of course, if you... Oh, dear, I just can't think what I'm always saying because I, I have the best intentions in the world, Mr. Barker. But, uh, Parker. Oh, yes, Parker, but I do somehow manage to offend people being so dependent and everything. <laughs> Except the men, of course. I couldn't offend you, Mr. Barker, a uh, Parker. <laughs> now, could I? <laughs> Madam, I'm not sure. Well, of course, the person I really came to see was Paul, Mr. Kenyon's brother. He's a little young, of course, but he's joining up next month, and I think we should all do our bit, don't you? <laughs> he has such a pleasant personality. I think he likes me. Why, if he walked in at that door this minute... Now, how am I ever going to get any place? Someone's always interrupting my revolver practice just when I'm getting to the point where I can... Oh. Why, Paul... Good Lord, are you here again? You're a very untidy object, Paul. Well, that's pretty untidy in the cellar. And dirty. I've got cockroaches on me, so keep away. Did you have a good day shooting? Swell. One of the best. Hit the target? On the only shot that mattered, I hit the target dead center. <coughs> that sounded like Isabel. I think it was Isabel. Why have you got those blinds down? Get them up. What is it? What's wrong with you? What are you looking at through that window? That was 25 years ago, Captain Burke. We found Jerry Kenyon lying across the table in the summer house. He'd shot himself through the head with his own revolver in the holster. It was lying on the floor beside him. Shut up, sir, I see. When Isabel found him, he'd been dead about half an hour. The doctors proved that, did they? Yes, that shot had been fired against his head. The front of his uniform cap was powder burned where the bullet entered. There's no doubt about that. None at all. We never noticed the real shot because... Because that young lad was shooting off guns like a maniac in the cellar. Precisely. Now they're all dead. By accident, illness, they're all gone. Isabel Kenyon died less than a year afterwards. I think she died just because she was so fond of Jerry. I suppose... You've guessed my little secret. Oh, I think I can sort of read between the lines. You were in love with Isabel Kenyon, weren't you? Yes. 
Well, these things happen. I never let her see it, you understand? Women know, pretty generally. So? They're gone. The youngest of them. And I'm left alone with old tunes, old ghosts, wondering why the fellow ever killed himself. Why? Why? And this morning, out of a clear sky, I get a letter saying, if you want to know how Major Kenyon really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. But I tell you, we know how he died. Well, aren't you going to do it? Naturally. I've got a key somewhere here that fits the drawer. Now, listen, Mr. Parker. In my father's country, in Ireland, they got a saying that when a man's going to commit suicide... I thought of doing that too once. Then the devil comes in and takes him by the hand and talks to him. They say you can see the devil as plain as I see you just before you pull the trigger. The devil must have been in the summer house that afternoon then. Oh, no, he wasn't. What do you mean? Major Kenyon didn't kill himself. He was murdered. My dear Captain Burke, the police covered all that at the time. Everybody had an alibi. They did, did they? Well, think of what I've told you. Isabel and I were together all the time. Paul, her brother, was shooting off guns in the cellar. Yeah. Diane Fisk. Yeah, what about her? Her chauffeur who drove her there swore he saw her walk straight up to the place. She passed the summer house but didn't stop there. Well, that checks. Even Kitty the maid could prove she'd never stirred out of the house until just a minute or so before Isabel went herself. Oh, and why did the maid have to leave the house at all? She was taking Jerry the black coffee he drank every afternoon. He'd already been dead half an hour then. And that, my dear Captain, disposes of everybody. Well, now listen, Mr. Parker. You're a good guy, and I'm not going to hold out on you any longer. You see, I say Major Kenyon was murdered because I know he was murdered. By an outsider? By one of the people in the house. That's impossible. Is it? Well, why don't you open that desk drawer and see? What time is it? Uh, it's a quarter to eight. Quarter to eight? And I haven't got much time. For what? Holy St. Patrick, will you open that drawer? If it's waited 25 years, my friend, it can wait a minute more. I've got the key somewhere in this bunch of keys. Everything the same. Paul never altered what he inherited. Same old desk, same old phonograph. Same old... I think this is the key. Yeah. It opens... There's nothing here except one or two old newspapers. Everything very dirty. The letter says to press hard at the back. Now, have you tried that? It doesn't seem to. Yes, my George, it does work. Well? There seems to be a movable back on a hinge. Well, what's inside? Uh, uh some sort of flat brown paper parcel sealed with wax. And about as dirty as it can get. Open it, man. Open it. I'm going to. It's a phonograph record. There's a plain white label. Something on it written in pencil. I don't see too well nowadays without my glasses. Uh, here, give it to me. I'll read it to Just you. Go on. A record of how I killed Jerry Kenyon. Say, don't you get it, Mr. Parker? This is the real goods. The murderer's going to tell us his own story 25 years later. Be careful. Whatever you do, don't drop it. You seem to be interested enough now. I don't say I'm not interested. I say I can't believe it. You know, when you were talking about the dead coming back and that kind of thing, you sure started giving me goose pimples. But that's just what it is, a dead person. Now, there's the phonograph. Put that record on. Let's hear what the ghost says. Any of them could have made the record, of course. The apparatus was all here. Don't just stand there by the phonograph. Want to work? Yes, it works. Is it wound up? Yes, it's wound up. Here goes. Now, look, Mr. Parker. Whose voice do you think it's going to be? I don't know. Now, I want to warn you. The voice you're going to hear from there... Please, be quiet. Listen. I've started it up. Well? Speak up. Who killed Jerry Kenyon? I killed him, Joe, dear. Isabel. I'm sorry about it, Joe. But I had to have you for an alibi. 
And you were so terribly easy to fool. It's only a phonograph record, man. Don't look at it as if it was alive. You said you and I were always together, Joe. But that wasn't quite true. I left you to go into the dining room and mix a highball, remember? Yes. And I was carrying my big knitting bag. Remember that, too? And there was something else in it besides knitting. I'm an awfully good revolver shot, Joe. I told you we were all good except Paul. And the back windows of the dining room faced the same way as the back windows of the library. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Jerry very much. was in the summer house. I made a sign to him from the window, and he came to the door there. In bright sunlight, 50 feet away. True again, Isabel. True Joe, again. don't you know what August heat is in a wooden summer house? Didn't you? Didn't anybody see that no man would be wearing a cap inside on a day like that? Jerry had taken his cap off before he went into the summer house. We saw him do it. He was bareheaded when he came to the door. So I lifted the revolver and shot him through the head. Then I dropped the gun back in my knitting bag and went back into the library with your drink. Isabel, don't talk back to the thing, man, or you'll drive me screwy. There was in my knitting bag, too. I had to use it. It was a duplicate of Jerry's army camp with a powder-burned hole already fired through it in the place I wanted. Very clever of you, Isabel. So I've been the goat for 25 years. I waited for some time and then slipped out to find the body. I fitted a new cap over Jerry's head in place where it ought to go. I put the old cap in my knitting bag. I took his revolver out of the holster and kept it. The gun that I'd used, I dropped on the floor beside him. So I proved it was suicide. You see? You proved it to me. Joe. Joe, listen, I, I'm very sick. They tell me I'm going to die. You are dead. Joe, I'm afraid. I'm going out in the dark and I... I don't know what's there. Don't go away, Isabel. Come Joe. Out. Just for a minute. Okay, I've had just about enough of this. Joe, I want you to tell everybody about it. I want you to tell them how a poor, crazy woman couldn't stand that man any longer. And how... There. It's cut off and it's going to stay cut off. Thank you. I've heard about enough, too. But you can't arrest her now, my friend. You can't arrest her now. After hearing that, I'm not going to arrest anybody. Tell me, Captain. Did you know what was on the record? No. That's why I had to hear it. I knew about it, but I wasn't sure what it had to say. But so help me, I never guessed how hard it would hit you. Man, don't you get it even yet? Yes, I get it. Oh, no, you don't. You don't see anything. That was how the fake suicide was managed, yes. That's just how it was all done, bar one or two little things. Only... Only what? Only it wasn't Isabel Kenyon who committed the murder. Did I hear you correctly? You did? This is another one of your little jokes, I imagine. Can't you let me alone? Have you some kind of personal spite against me? What did I Hold ever it. do? You're going to hear the real truth now if I have to hold you down in that chair. I know Mrs. Kenyon didn't kill her husband because I've just come from talking to the real murderer up the river. But they're all dead. Oh, no, they're not. And I haven't got much time either. That clock's just going to strike eight. What's the time got to do Good with deal it? Good deal if you will follow me. Mrs. Kenyon died less than a year after her husband, didn't she? Yes. But it wasn't Mrs. Kenyon's voice you just heard in that record. What? I'm telling you, the real murderer hated her. Hated her like poison and wanted her blame for the crime. When Mrs. Kenyon died, the real murderer wrote a letter. Well? But she never mailed that letter. She made a lying record of Isabel Kenyon's voice as evidence. Now you figure it out for yourself. Who was pretty enough to take Major Kenyon's eye and strike back like fury when she got thrown over? Who wanted to go on the stage and do impersonations? Kitty, the maid. Ah, you're talking sense. She shot Jerry from the dining room window. When she couldn't borrow Mrs. Kenyon's knitting bag, she went out to the summer house with a gun and the fake cap wrapped a napkin on a coffee tray. She did go out, I remember. Actually, she got there before Mrs. Kenyon did. But the summer house was dark inside and Mrs. Kenyon never noticed her. The next day, Kitty wrote that letter, but she couldn't bring herself to send it. So she kept that letter till the day before yesterday, 
Then one of the boys at Sing Sing... Wait a minute. ...thinking he was doing her a kind action, put a stamp on it and mailed it. Did you say Sing Sing? Yes. They're electrocuting her tonight for the murder of an Italian down at Collier's Hook. I found out about the record, all right. But the one thing I wasn't sure of was if, that she had done the job alone. Now, frankly, the way you acted, I thought that you might have been in on it, too. Well, that's why I had to hear it through. And it was anything but a joke. And now, here it goes to blazes forever. Eight o'clock. Now she's dead. And so ends The Devil in the Summer House. Tonight's story of Suspense. The part of Mr. Parker was played by Martin Gable. Again next Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. A story dedicated to the thrill of the nighttime, the hushed voice and the prowling step. Another adventure in suspense. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs> 